Section 17 of A Commentary on the Epistle to the Romans by John Calvin, translated by Francis Sibson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Romans 11, verses 24 to 36. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Behold, therefore, by placing the whole state of the case before the view of his readers, Paul confirms in a more clear and luminous manner the groundless nature of that pride in which the Gentiles exalted over the Jews. The heathens behold in the Israelites an example of divine severity, which ought to impress them with the deepest terror, while in their own case they have a proof of grace and goodness which ought to excite them to gratitude alone, and to extol not themselves but the Lord, the fountain of all love and mercy. The following is the sense of the Apostle. Consider first your former character before you insult over the calamity of the Jews, for you were threatened with the same divine severity, unless you had been delivered from it by his gratuitous goodness. Consider, in the second place, your present character, for your salvation can only be secured by acknowledging, with humbleness of mind, the mercy of infinite love. Should you, however, forget yourself, and exult with insolence over the Jews, the same ruin into which they have fallen will be assigned as your lot. For it is not sufficient to have embraced at one period only in your life the grace of God, unless during its whole course you steadily pursue the call of your Saviour, and walk in the light of His countenance. For it is the bounden duty of those who have been enlightened by divine truth, and put on the very armour of light, to have their meditations always fixed on their own perseverance, for those professors by no means continue in the goodness of a merciful Lord, who, after having answered for some time to the divine call, begin finally to loathe the kingdom of heaven, and not to run the race that is set before them. Such ingratitude causes them to merit a second blindness." He does not add each individual believer, as stated above, but compares at the same time the Gentiles with the Jews. It is true that every individual of the Jewish nation received the recompense due to his unbelief when he renounced the kingdom of God, and all called to be believers from the heathens were vessels of mercy. We must, however, always keep our attention fixed on Paul's design, for he was desirous that the Gentiles should depend on the eternal covenant of God, that they might join their own salvation with that of the chosen people to prevent them from being offended and stumbling at the rejection of the jews as if the ancient adoption of that people had been disannulled paul was desirous to impress their minds with terror by the example of the punishment inflicted upon the israelites that they might keep their attention fixed with reverential awe upon this divine judgment for why do we indulge with such unbridled licentiousness in curious disputes but from our general neglect of those inquiries which are deservedly calculated to teach us the invaluable lesson of humility the condition is added, if they continue in his goodness, because he is not here disputing with regard to individuals who are elected, but the whole body of the nation. I confess indeed that every abuser of divine goodness merits to be deprived of the grace which is given him, but it would be improper to say particularly of any of the pious that God showed the believer pity when he chose him, provided he continue in that mercy, for the perseverance of faith which perfects the effect of divine grace in us flows from election itself." paul therefore teaches us that the gentiles were admitted into the hope of eternal life on this very condition that they might retain the possession of it by their gratitude and certainly the horrible revolt of all christendom which afterwards followed afforded a luminous evidence of the necessity of this admonition for after god had nearly in a moment so watered the well-known world in almost every direction with his grace that religion flourished in the whole roman empire the truth of the gospel soon afterwards disappeared and the treasure of salvation was removed. What reason can be assigned for so sudden a change but the falling away of the heathens from their calling? Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. We here understand the sense in which Paul now threatens the cutting off of those whom he had before confessed to be ingrafted into the hope of life by the election of God. For indeed, although this cannot befall elect individuals, yet such exhortation is absolutely required to subdue the pride of the flesh, which, as it is in reality opposed to their salvation, so it ought deservedly to be kept in constant terror by the fear of damnation. For Christians, so far as they are enlightened by faith, hear for their assurance that the calling of God is without repentance, but since they carry about with them a body of flesh which indulges in lasciviousness against the grace of God, the voice of divine truth, take heed lest thou fall, teaches them the important lesson of humility. 
My former solution of the difficulty must be kept in view, that Paul is not here disputing concerning the special election of every individual believer, but opposing the Jews to the Gentiles, and he does not therefore so much address the elect in these words as those boasters of their having taken possession of the situation formerly held by the Jews. Nay, at the same time he addresses the Gentiles, and directs his remarks to the whole body of them in common, among whom there were many believers and members of Christ only in name. Should the question be proposed concerning individuals, how any one may be cut off after he has been grafted in, and the contrary? It can be answered by considering three kinds of grafting in, and two of cutting off. For in the first place the children of believers are grafted in, to whom the promise is due according to the covenant entered into with their fathers. Secondly, those are grafted in who receive indeed the seed of the gospel, but it either does not strike its roots sufficiently deep, or is choked before it brings forth fruit. Thirdly, the elect are grafted in who are illuminated for everlasting life by the immutable purpose of God. The first are cut off when they reject the promise given the fathers, or otherwise do not receive it from ingratitude. The second, when the seed has become withered or corrupted, and the danger of this evil threatens all with respect to their own nature. The admonition given by Paul, it must be acknowledged, pertains also in some measure to believers, for the purpose of preventing them from indulging in the torpid dullness and sluggishness of the flesh. Suffice it to observe on the present passage that the same punishment inflicted by God upon the Jews is denounced against the Gentiles if their conduct is similar. For God is able... This argument would be cold and lifeless when applied to profane persons, for although they grant Jehovah to be possessed of power, yet because they consider it is shut up at a distance in heaven, they generally deprive it of all vigour and efficacy. But since the faithful, whenever the power of God is named, regard it as a work actually present, Paul considered the mere statement of it sufficient to appall their minds. The apostle lays it down as a settled maxim that God so avenges the incredulity of his people as never entirely to forget his clemency. Thus also on other occasions he often restores his kingdom after he had appeared to deprive the Jews of it entirely. Paul shows also, by a comparison, how much easier it is to subvert the present appearance of things than to establish them, how much more readily the natural branches, when restored to the place from which they had been cut off, derive substance from their own root, than the wild and unfruitful of a foreign stock. The same relation and analogy take place between the Jews and Gentiles. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant. He is desirous to arrest more fully the attention of his readers by professing that he would make them acquainted with a subject still hid in mystery. Paul has sufficient reason for adopting this plan, for he is desirous by a concise and plain sentence to bring this very difficult subject to a conclusion, and would have expected to read the declaration he makes on this occasion. The clause lest you should be wise in your own conceits, points out the apostle's scope and intention to be the restraining of the insolence of the Gentiles, lest they be elated in pride against the Jews. This exhortation was very necessary, lest the revolt of the Jews from God should produce an immoderate effect upon the feelings of men of weak minds, as if a perpetual conclusion was put to the salvation of any of the children of men. This is equally useful for us at the present period, that we may know the salvation of the remaining number, which the Lord will at last gather to himself, lies concealed, being sealed, as it were, with a ring. Should the long-continued delay ever induce us to despair, let us not forget the word mystery, by which Paul instructs us that the manner of the conversion of the Jews will be neither common nor usual, and he thus points out the extreme rashness and folly of those who shall endeavour to measure it by their own sense and judgment. For what is more ridiculous than to consider that to be incredible which is removed from our sense? Since it is therefore called a mystery because we cannot comprehend it before the time of its being revealed. It has been disclosed to us, as it was to the Romans, that our faith, satisfied with the word of truth, may keep us waiting in hope until the event itself shall bring it to light. That blindness in part the apostle was desirous to diminish the harshness of his language by the words 
in part, which relate, in my opinion, neither to time nor multitude, but convey the idea in some measure. The particle until does not imply either the order or progress of time, but merely so that the fullness of the Gentiles. The meaning, therefore, of the passage is the following. God has in some measure so blinded Israel that the gospel may be transferred to the Gentiles, while the Jews reject its light, and the former sees, as it were, upon the vacant possession. This blindness of the Jews, therefore, is subservient to the providence of God for the purpose of accomplishing the ordained salvation of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles means a large concourse, for they did not, as formerly, unite themselves to the Jews as a few rare and scattered proselytes, but the change was such that the heathens formed almost the entire body of the church. And so all Israel. Many expositors make this passage relate to the Jewish people, as if the meaning of Paul was that religion should be renewed among the Israelites as before, but I extend the sense of the word Israel to the whole people of God, and thus interpret it, when the Gentiles shall have entered into the church, and the Jews at the same time shall betake themselves to the obedience of faith, and forsake their present revolt from the Saviour of the lost, the salvation of the whole Israel of God, which must be collected from both, will thus be completed, and in such a manner that the descendants of the father of the faithful, as being the firstborn in the family of God, shall enjoy the preeminence. I consider this exposition to agree better with the context, because Paul was desirous to point out here the consummation of the kingdom of Christ, which was by no means limited to the Jews, but comprehends the whole world. And in the same manner, Galatians 6.16, he denominates the church, which consisted equally of Jews and Gentiles, the Israel of God, and opposes a people, thus collected from a scattered and waste state, to the carnal children of Abraham, who had departed from his faith. As this testimony of Isaiah does not confirm the whole sentence, but merely one member of it, namely, that the sons of Abraham are partakers of redemption. If any interpreter adopts the following as the sense of the prophet, that Christ was promised and offered to the Jews, but they had been deprived of the advantages of a saviour because he had been rejected by them, he drops out of his consideration part of the meaning of Isaiah, namely, that there would still remain a certain number of Israelites who, after having repented, would enjoy the grace of deliverance through the Messiah. Paul does not cite the passage from Isaiah with verbal accuracy, for the prophet writes, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Isaiah 59.20 We need not distress ourselves unnecessarily on this point, for we ought to consider how suitably the apostles adapt all their proofs from the Old Testament to their own purpose, and they were only desirous to point their readers to the passages in the original, where they referred them to the fountain itself. Besides, in the prophecy, although deliverance is promised to the spiritual people of God, under whom the Gentiles are also included, yet because the Jews are the firstborn, which is declared by the prophet, it was necessary that the prediction should chiefly be fulfilled in the posterity of Abraham. For the scripture attributes to the whole people of God the name Israelites, because of the excellence of the nation, which the Lord preferred to all others. Isaiah expressly says, The Redeemer will come from Zion in consequence of his having a regard to the ancient covenant. He adds also that those will be redeemed in Jacob who have repented and turned from their transgression. The God of Jacob distinctly claims some seed to himself in these words, that redemption may continue to be effectual in his elect and peculiar nation. Paul felt no scruple in following the common Greek translation, where it is said, The Redeemer will come out of Mount Zion although the language of the prophet in the Hebrew, Isaiah 52.20, he will come to Zion, suited the purpose of the apostle better. The same reason also can be assigned for the second part of the quotation, and shall turn ungodliness from Jacob, for Paul considered this sufficiently to answer his view, because it is the peculiar office of Christ to reconcile an apostate and covenant-breaking people to God, and some conversion was certainly to be expected, lest the whole posterity of Isaac should, at the same time, perish in one common ruin. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away. Paul, in the last prophecy quoted from Isaiah, had briefly touched on the duty of the Messiah for the purpose of instructing the Jews concerning the great advantages which might chiefly be expected to flow from the establishment of his kingdom. Yet he intentionally added with the same design these few words from Jeremiah. 
chapter 31, verse 33 and 34. See Hebrews 8, 8 to 12, 10, 16 to 17. Paul designedly subjoined in his quotation from Isaiah, shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, because it afforded a confirmation of the point he was discussing. His declaration concerning the conversion of the Israelites might appear to be unworthy of credit during the confirmed obstinacy displayed by that nation. This obstacle is removed by stating that the new covenant consisted in the gratuitous remission of sin. For it follows as a conclusion from the words of the prophet that God would have only to forgive the crime of perfidy and other sins in his treatment of an apostate people. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. As concerning the gospel, he proves the greatest and worst crime in the Jews' unbelief not to be of such a nature as to entitle them, on that account, to be despised by the Gentiles. For they had been so blinded for a time by the providence of God, such is Paul's doctrine, that a way might be formed for the gospel to go to the Gentiles. But they had not for ever been excluded from the grace of God. Paul confesses the Jews are alienated from God for the present on account of the gospel, that salvation, which had first been entrusted to them, might be carried to the Gentiles. God, however, is not unmindful of the covenant which he had made with their fathers, by which he testified his embracing in love that nation by his eternal purpose and counsel. The apostle confirms this by an important and excellent truth, that the grace of the divine calling cannot be in vain, which is implied by Paul's expressions, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. The gifts and callings of God mean, by hypology, the kindness and benefit of the calling of God, nor ought this to be understood as relating to any other calling but that by which God adopted the posterity of Abraham into his covenant, since this was the particular subject in dispute. In the same manner, by the word election, he meant a little before the secret purpose and counsel by which the Jews were formerly distinguished from the Gentiles. Paul, it must be remembered, is not here treating of the private election of any individual, but the common adoption of the whole nation, which may externally indeed appear to have fallen off for a time, but has not been cut off from the root. Because the Jews had been deprived from their own fault of their right to salvation, which had been promised them, Paul, that some hope may continue concerning the remnant, contends that the counsel and decree of God remain firm and immutable, by which he had once condescended to elect them for himself as a peculiar people. If, therefore, it was impossible for the Lord to depart in any way from the covenant which he had entered into with Abraham, Genesis 17.7, I will be the God of thy seed, he did not entirely turn away his kindness from the Jewish nation. The apostle does not oppose the gospel to election, as if there was a disagreement between them, for God calls his elect but because the gospel was immediately contrary to the expectations of the world preached to the gentiles he justly compares this grace with the ancient election of the jews that had been manifested so many ages before it is therefore denominated election from its antiquity for god passed by the rest of the world and chose this one people for himself from among all other nations when paul says for the father's sake he does not trace the origin of election to the worth of the patriarchs, but teaches that, according to the form of the covenant, which included the seed as well as the fathers, grace had been propagated by lineal descent from the patriarchs to their posterity. It has been already stated how the heathens obtained mercy by the unbelief of the Jews. Namely, God, who was angry with the Jews on account of their unbelief, turned aside his kindness to the Gentiles. The following sentence, these have now been made unbelievers, when mercy was bestowed on the Gentiles, is a little harsh, but it involves no absurdity, since Paul is not assigning the cause of this blindness, but only means, that God had deprived the Jews of the blessing he transferred to the Gentiles. Because the Israelites had lost the blessing by their own unbelief, to prevent the Gentiles from imagining they had attained the gospel by the merit of faith, he makes mention of nothing else than mercy. The sum of the whole is, 
because God was desirous to have pity on the Gentiles, the Jews were, on this occasion, deprived of the light of faith. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief. A very beautiful sentence which shows there is no cause why any who entertain the least hopes of their own salvation should despair of the salvation of others. Whatever their present character may be, they formerly were the same as all others, and if, by the alone mercy of God, they have emerged from the depths of infidelity, they ought to leave room for the operations of the same pity in converting unbelievers to the truth. For he makes the Jews equal with the Gentiles in their state of guiltiness, for the purpose of convincing both that the entrance and access to eternal salvation are fully opened to all nations and classes of mankind. There is only one mercy that saves, and this offers itself with the same freedom to Jew and heathen. This opinion agrees with the testimony of Hosea, chapter 2, verse 23, quoted above, Romans 9.25, I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people. Paul does not mean that God so hardens all men as their unbelief is to be imputed to the fountain of infinite mercy, tenderness, and love but such are the dispensations of the all-gracious providence that the whole human race stands convicted of unbelief and is condemned by the divine judgment and the design of omnipotence in this arrangement is to make salvation depend on his own goodness alone and to bury and sink forever all the claims of merit paul intends to impress on his readers the two following truths that there is nothing besides the mere grace of God in any individual of the human race, on account of the merit of which he deserves to have a preference shown him above others, and that the supreme being, in the dispensation of his grace, is not hindered from bestowing it on whomsoever he chooses. The word mercy is emphatic, for it means that the judge of all is under no restriction from any of the sons of Adam, and he therefore saves all gratuitously, because all are equally sunk in ruin." Nothing can equal the gross conception of those madmen who infer from this passage the salvation of the whole human race. Paul simply means that Jews and Gentiles obtain salvation from no other cause than the mercy of God, that he may leave no ground for any one to complain. It is an undoubted truth that this mercy is offered equally to all, and granted to none but those who have sought it by faith. O oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out! For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counsellor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory for ever. Amen. O oh, the depth! The apostle here for the first time breaks forth into language which arises spontaneously in the feelings of believers from a pious consideration of the works of an infinite creator. Paul restrains in passing the audacity of impiety which is accustomed to rail against the judgments of God. When therefore we hear the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and goodness of God, we cannot express how much power this admiration ought to have in repressing the rashness of the fleshly mind. For Paul, after having disputed from the word and spirit of the Most High, overcome at last by the sublimity of so great a secret, can do nothing else than exclaim in astonishment that the riches of the wisdom of God are too great for our reason to fathom their depths. Should we, therefore, at any time enter into a discourse concerning the eternal counsels of a merciful Father, we ought always to restrain and curb both our genius and language, speaking with sobriety and without the limits prescribed by the word of God, and our disputation should at last end in wonder and amazement. For we ought not to feel ashamed if our wisdom does not surpass his, who, being carried into the third heavens, saw mysteries that man could not utter, nor could he find any other conclusion for so elevated a subject than this humiliation of his own powers. The interpretation of those commentators is forced who consider depth to be taken as an adjective, and thus analyze the expressions of the apostle, O oh, the deep riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, meaning by riches, liberality and bounty. Paul, I doubt not, extols the deep riches of wisdom and knowledge in the Lord of glory. How unsearchable! He expresses the same subject in different words, which is a kind of repetition common among the Hebrews. For having spoken of judgments, he adds ways, meaning God's plans or manner of acting, or order of government. He still goes on with his exclamation, and the more he extols the depths of the divine secret, the more forcibly does he deter us from the curiosity of our investigations. 
let us learn therefore to make no other inquiries concerning the lord but as scripture has revealed them otherwise we shall enter a labyrinth from which we shall not find it easy to make our escape we must here observe that the apostle is not speaking of every kind of mysteries but of those which being hidden in the mind of infinite wisdom he wishes us only to admire and adore for who hath known the mind of the lord he here as it were lays his hand on human presumption and restrains it from murmuring against the judgments of a glorious saviour he assigns two reasons against such complaints and murmurings all the race of mortals according to his first argument are prevented by their complete blindness from examining the predestination of god by their own proper judgment and it is the height of rashness and folly to enter into disputes concerning a subject altogether unknown the second reason adduced by paul is that we have no cause for complaining of god since no human being can boast as if the lord of all power was a debtor to man on the other hand all are dependent on his kindness and bounty every inquirer into the secret counsels of infinite wisdom should remember to confine his mind within the limits of the oracles of god and never in investigating the predestination of perfect knowledge and love advance beyond the barriers of scripture although the lost children of adam as we know can discern nothing in the subject with greater clearness than a blind man in the midst of the thickest darkness yet the certainty of our faith which arises not from the acute sagacity of human judgment but the illumination of the spirit alone cannot be weakened or undermined by this cause for according even to paul himself in another passage who though he affirms that all the mysteries of god far exceed the comprehension of our capacity yet the faithful as he owns have the mind of the lord for they have not received the spirit of this world but of the fountain and author of all good who makes them acquainted with his otherwise incomprehensible kindness as therefore by our own powers we are wholly unable to arrive at a certain acquaintance with the secrets of god so by the grace of the holy spirit we are admitted to a sure and clear knowledge of these hidden truths if it is our duty to follow at present the leadings of the spirit we ought when forsaken by him to stop and take as it were our stand whoever affects to know more than the spirit has revealed will be overwhelmed by the immense splendour of his unapproachable light we must never lose sight of the distinction lately mentioned between the secret counsel of god and his will revealed in scripture for though the whole doctrine of the word of truth surpasses in its sublimity human genius yet the faithful who follow with reverence and soberness the guidings of the spirit are not debarred from approaching the records of eternal wisdom but the secret counsel of god the depth and height of which can be reached by no inquiry is to be considered in a very different point of view isaiah forty thirteen wisdom nine thirteen one corinthians two sixteen or who hath first given to him this is another reason by which the justice of god is very forcibly and ably defended against all the accusations and charges of the wicked that if no obligation is imposed on god by the merits of any human being it is impossible for any one justly to expostulate with infinite justice because he does not receive a remuneration for it is absolutely required that every human being who is desirous to force any one to do him a kindness should be able to produce those duties by the performance of which he is entitled to make such a claim god according to this passage of paul cannot be accused of injustice unless it can be said the source and fountain of all lord does not pay every one his due it is also evident no person can be deprived of his rights by god since he is indebted to none for who can boast of any of his own works by which he merited the grace of infinite love this is a striking passage and teaches us that it is not in our power by any good actions of our own to challenge our eternal sovereign to grant us salvation but he prevents the undeserving by his gratuitous goodness for paul shows what men are in the habit of doing as well as their ability if we are indeed ready carefully to examine our character we shall find that infinite majesty is in no respect our debtor while all mankind stand arraigned before his judgment seat so far therefore from deserving any favour at his hand eternal death is too slight a punishment for our disobedience nor does paul only conclude that jehovah is not our debtor on account of our corrupt and vicious nature but he asserts man provided he were entire and perfect could produce nothing before god by which his favour might be conciliated and secured 
because from the very commencement of his being the child of adam is so bound to his maker by the very law of creation that he has nothing which can be considered his own property we shall therefore endeavour without effect to rob the all-perfect lord of his right to determine to do freely what he chooses with the works of his hands according to his own unerring wisdom for nothing done by the creatures of a day has made the king of glory their debtors and the supreme being is laid under no obligation to the potsherds of the earth for of him and through him this is a confirmation of the preceding opinion for he shows it is impossible for us to be able to boast in any good of our own against god since we ourselves are created by him out of nothing and our very being now consists in him paul hence concludes that equity demands our existence to be directed and devoted to his glory how absurd would it be to refer the creatures which the father of all mercy hath formed and preserved to any other purpose than the illustration of his glory the greek preposition here used i know is sometimes improperly understood to mean in but since the more common acceptation of the term corresponds better with the present argument i prefer to retain it rather than have recourse to a sense rarely used the whole order of nature is subverted such as the sum of the apostles argument unless the same god who is the beginning of all things be also the end to him be glory he now confidently adopts the proposition as undoubtedly proved that god's glory ought on all occasions to remain undiminished the opinion if understood in a general sense will be cold and uninteresting and its force and emphasis depend on the circumstance of the passage and convey the following important truth that our only refuge and tower justly claims to himself entire and unbounded dominion and power and that nothing besides the glory of the king of kings is to be sought in the state of mankind and of the whole world the absurdity unreasonableness nay folly and madness are here clearly established of all sentiments which tend to derogate from the splendour of the glory of the father of lights and the fountain of all good End of section seventeen. Section 18 of A Commentary on the Epistle to the Romans by John Calvin, translated by Francis Sibson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Romans 12, verses 1 to 21. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of god after paul has treated of those subjects with which it was necessary for him to commence in erecting the kingdom of god and shown that we must seek for righteousness from one god and look for salvation only from his mercy and that the sum of all our happiness is placed and daily offered to us in christ alone he now according to the very best arrangement proceeds to consider the method for forming our moral character since the soul is renewed as it were into a heavenly life by the knowledge of god and of christ which bringeth salvation the conduct of life itself also is in a manner formed and regulated by the holy admonitions exhortations and precepts of his wisdom for you will in vain manifest your zeal and care for the regulating of men's conduct in life if you have not first proved that the origin of all righteousness exists in god and christ and thus shown how the sons of adam may be raised from the death of sin this is indeed the leading distinction between the gospel and philosophy for though philosophers discourse in a noble manner and which merits great praise on account of the genius they display concerning morals yet all the ornament that shines forth in their precepts is nothing else but the splendid outside of a building without a foundation for by omitting the principles on which morality should rest they present to our view a mutilated doctrine and as it were a body without a head the manner of teaching by the papists is much the same for though they incidentally speak of faith in christ and the grace of the holy spirit yet it is distinctly seen how much nearer they approach the heathen philosophers than christ or his apostles and as the philosophers before they make any laws concerning morals discuss the end and design of goodness and inquire into those sources of virtues 
from which they may afterwards search out and derive all their duties, so Paul hath here determined the principle from which all the parts of holiness flow, namely that we are redeemed by the Lord for this very end, that we may consecrate to him ourselves and all our members. But we will be amply repaid by a close examination of every part of this passage. I beseech you by the mercies of God. We know that men of corrupt minds gladly lay hold of everything proposed in Scripture concerning the immense goodness of God for the purpose of indulging the flesh. Hypocrites, on the other hand, as if the grace of the Lord extinguishes their zeal for a holy life and opens a gate for boldness in sin, maliciously obscure, as far as they can, their knowledge of God's goodness. And this declaration of the Apostle shows that men can never worship God with earnest affection, nor be roused with sufficient eagerness to fear and obey Him, until they clearly understand how much they owe to divine mercy. It is sufficient for papists if they extort by terror, I know not what kind of compulsory obedience. But Paul, that he might bind us to God, not by servile fear, but by a voluntary and cheerful love of righteousness, allures us by the sweetness of that grace in which our salvation is contained, and at the same time upbraids our ingratitude if, after experiencing so kind and liberal a father, we do not in return study to devote ourselves entirely to his service. And Paul's exhortation is more powerful in proportion as he excels all others in illustrating the grace of God. For that heart must be harder than iron which is not inflamed by the doctrine already stated by the Apostle to be the love of God, and does not feel the abundant kindness of the Lord displayed in Christ Jesus. What then shall we say of those who consider all exhortations to a life of virtue to be taken away when the salvation of man is placed in the grace of God alone, since a pious mind can be formed to obey God by no precepts and by no sanctions, so surely as by a serious meditation upon the divine mercy exhibited to itself? We may here also at the same time observe the gentleness of the spirit of the Apostle, because he preferred rather to manage and to govern the faithful by admonitions and faithful entreaties than by rigid commands, since he knew such a mode of treatment would be more successful with docile characters. That you may present your bodies. To know ourselves to be consecrated to God is the beginning of a proper course of life for attaining good works since it hence follows that we cease to live to ourselves with the intention of devoting all the actions of our lives to God. Two things, therefore, are here to be considered. First, that we are the Lord's. In the second place, that we ought to be devoted to Him on this very account, because it is dishonouring the holiness of God to offer anything to Him which has not been first consecrated. This position being granted, it necessarily follows that we ought to meditate on holiness during our whole life. And if we relapse into uncleanness, we cannot avoid the appearance of sacrilege, since it is nothing else than the profaning of what was sanctified. Great propriety of expression is also everywhere preserved. Paul particularly states that our bodies ought to be offered as a sacrifice to God, by which he insinuates that we have not authority over ourselves, but are wholly devoted to the power of God, which must necessarily be the case, unless we renounce and therefore deny ourselves. He afterwards declares by the additional epithets the quality of the sacrifice, for when he calls it living, he signifies that we are offered as a sacrifice to God for the purpose of being raised to newness of life, and of having our former life destroyed, and our conduct changed. He means by the name holiness the property of the sacrifice we have mentioned, for a sacrificial oblation is confirmed when sanctification has preceded its ratification. The third epithet not only teaches us that our life is properly regulated if we conduct this sacrificing of ourselves according to the will of God, but also produces uncommon consolation because it instructs us that our endeavours and zeal are grateful and acceptable to God when we devote ourselves to innocence and holiness. And by bodies he does not merely mean bones and flesh, but the whole mass of which we consist, and he cites this phrase that he may point out all our constituent parts by this one expression. For the members of our bodies are the instruments by which we execute the actions of our lives. In another passage, the Apostle, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, requires of us not only our whole body, but our soul and spirit. In ordering us to offer ourselves, he makes an allusion to the sacrifices under the Mosaic dispensation, which were presented before the altar, as in the presence of God. And he elegantly points out our alacrity in listening to the commands of God, for the purpose of immediately yielding them obedience. 
whence we infer that all those who do not intend to worship God err and wander in a miserable manner from the truth. We now also understand what kind of sacrifices Paul commends to the Christian church. For being reconciled to God by the one sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are, on his account, all made priests, with the view of dedicating ourselves and all we have and do to the glory of the Most Holy. No expiatory sacrifice remains to be offered, nor can this be attempted without great dishonour to the cross of Christ. Your reasonable service. I think the Apostle added this sentence to supply an explication and confirmation of the proceeding, as if he had said, Present yourselves a sacrifice to God, if you are resolved in your minds to offer him worship, for this is the proper way of honouring the Lord of heaven and earth, and such as depart from the method here prescribed, entirely err as worshippers of an infinite sovereign. And if God is then properly worshipped when all our actions are regulated according to his commands, let all human inventions in worship be removed and driven from among us, which God himself justly abominates, since obedience is better than sacrifice. Men indeed smile with complacency on their own inventions, and display a vain show of wisdom, as is stated in another part of the Apostle's writings. But we hear what the heavenly judge declares in opposition to this by the mouth of Paul. For when the Apostle calls that a rational worship which God has commanded, he rejects everything as foolish, insipid, and marked by unhallowed rashness, which we endeavour to establish in opposition to the rule of his word. And be not conformed to this world. The expression world has many significations, and is here understood to mean the disposition, inclination, and character of mankind. The Apostle justly forbids us to be conformed to such a mass of corruption, for, as the whole world lieth in the wicked one, we ought to put off every part of the mere human character, if we desire truly to put on Christ. And to remove all doubt, he explains it by the contrary, when he orders us to be transformed in the renewing of our mind, for in the scriptures these antitheses frequently occur, and add much to the clearness of the subject under consideration. But in this case attend to the renewal which is demanded of us, namely not of the flesh only, for this word is explained by the Sorbonists to mean the lower and animal part of our nature, but of the mind, which is the most excellent part, and to which the philosophers assign complete sovereignty, for they denominate it the governing power, and reason, according to them, is imagined to be the queen in ruling over man, and distinguished as the highest for wisdom. Paul even casts this empress from her throne, and reduces her to nothing, when he teaches us to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. For much as we flatter ourselves, yet the opinion of Christ remains true, that the whole man must be born again in every person who is desirous to enter into the kingdom of God, because we are entirely alienated both in mind and heart from the divine righteousness. To prove what is his will. Here you have the end and design for which we ought to put on a new mind, that, bidding adieu to our own counsels and desires, and those of our fellow men, we may devote ourselves entirely to the sole will of God, whose knowledge is true wisdom. But if the renewal of our mind is necessary for the purpose of proving what the will of the Most High is, we may hence see how much this mind is opposed to God. The epithets are added for the purpose of praising the will of infinite truth, that we may labour with greater cheerfulness to attain this object. And our obstinacy can only be reduced to order by ascribing the sure and lasting praise of righteousness and perfection to the will of God. The world is convinced that its works are good, Paul opposes such an opinion, and asserts good and evil are to be determined according to the will of God. The world applauds itself and delights in its own fancies and imaginations, but Paul affirms that nothing pleases God but his own commands. The world, that it may discover perfection, forsakes the word of God, and is inclined to adopt new inventions. Perfection is only to be found, according to Paul, in the will of infinite purity and he proves that every one who transgresses this law of absolute holiness is deluded by a false imagination. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For I say, through the grace... If the illative particle for is not considered to be superfluous, this sentence will very well agree with the former. For since he was desirous that all our study should be now devoted to the will of God, 
his next object was to withdraw us from all vain curiosity it may however be considered a mere affirmation since this particle is frequently redundant in paul and the sense will in this instance also be very coherent but before giving any command he informs them of the authority with which he was entrusted that they may pay the same attention to the word of paul as of god himself for his expressions convey the following meaning i do not speak of myself but as an ambassador of god i communicate to you those commandments which he enjoined myself grace as in a former part of the epistle means apostleship by which he commends the goodness of the most holy in bestowing this blessing and intimates that he had not forced himself into such an office by any rashness of his own but had engaged in it at the call of god by such a preface therefore while he secures his own authority he necessarily binds the romans to obey him unless they wish to despise god in the person of his servant the precept then follows for the purpose of withdrawing us from the investigation of such subjects as can only harass the mind without edification and paul orders us not to undertake more than our capacity and vocation permit he at the same time admonishes us to think and meditate only on such subjects as are calculated to make us sober and modest i prefer this view of the passage to the translation given by erasmus that no one think proudly of himself because this sense is more forced and does not so well agree with the context the sentence not to think more highly than he ought shows that we exceed the bounds of wisdom if we engage ourselves in such subjects as ought not to occupy our attention but to think soberly is to devote ourselves to those studies by which we may feel ourselves trained and educated to a due sense of modesty according as god hath dealt to every one paul here expresses the cause and reason of the sober wisdom which he commends for since the distribution of graces is various every one has determined upon the best manner for attaining wisdom who confines himself within that grace of faith which is conferred upon him by the lord there is not only a useless affectation of wisdom in discussing subjects superfluous of themselves and the knowledge of which is of no advantage but even in obtaining an acquaintance with what is otherwise useful if by not considering the extent of our faculties we exceed in temerity and boldness the measure of our understanding and god does not suffer such unwarrantable eagerness to escape without due punishment for we frequently observe a bewildering maze of absurd ravings take possession of men who by a foolish ambition exalt themselves above the boundaries determined by the giver of all good in fine a very striking part of our rational sacrifice consists in every one presenting himself to god to be governed and directed by a mild and docile spirit moreover paul in opposing faith to human judgment restrains us from indulging our own opinions and designedly prescribes at the same time a safe measure for the faithful by ordering them in humility not to overstep the bounds marked out by their own imperfections for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office so we being many are one body in christ and every one members one of another having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry let us wait on our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching or he that exhorteth on exhortation he that giveth let him do it with simplicity he that ruleth with diligence he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness for as paul now confirms the position that he had laid down and by which he limited the wisdom of each believer in christ according to the measure of his faith and establishes it by considering the nature of his calling for we are called on this condition that we may unite as in one body since christ has established the same society and communion among all his people that exists among the members of the human body and because men could not form by any effort of their own so intimate a connection with each other the messiah became himself the bond of that union because therefore the same wisdom which is observed in the human body ought to exist also in the society of the faithful paul proves by this very comparison how necessary it is for each member of the body of christ to consider what best suits his nature and character what his capacity what his calling since also this similitude has various parts it can be applied in the following manner to the case under consideration 
that as the members of our body have distinct powers and are all distinct in themselves and no one member possesses at the same time all powers or takes to itself the offices which belong to others so god has dispensed to us various endowments and by this distinction established among us an order which he wished to be preserved that each believer might regulate himself according to the measure of his own ability and not thrust himself into duties belonging to others and that no individual might desire at the same time to have all but content with his own lot voluntarily refrain from usurping the offices assigned to others by expressly pointing out the communion that exists among us he clearly intimates how great diligence ought to be exerted for appropriating to the common good of the whole body of the church the powers which each member individually possesses having gifts paul does not simply now preach concerning the cherishing of brotherly love but he commends modesty and humility which are the best means for regulating the whole course of our lives and all our conduct every person is desirous to have so great a supply as to stand in no need from his brethren but the very bond of this mutual communication consists in no individual having sufficient for himself but in his being compelled to borrow from others i confess therefore that the society of the pious consists in each being contented with his own measure while he bestows upon his brethren the gifts which he has received and suffers himself to be assisted in turn by the gifts of others but the apostle was particularly desirous to repress that pride which he knew to be innate in mankind and to prevent believers from being disappointed because all gifts were not bestowed upon them paul therefore shows that every disciple of christ has his own part assigned him with the best intention and counsel of infinite wisdom since it was necessary for the common salvation of the body that no single person should be so furnished with the fullness of gifts as to despise any of his brethren with impunity here therefore we have the chief object aimed at by the apostle that all things are not equally calculated for all but the good things of our heavenly father are so distributed that each has a limited portion every individual also ought to be so intent upon bestowing his own gifts for the edification of the church that none may forsake his own function and enter upon another's for the safety of the church is preserved by this very beautiful order and as it were symmetry where each of himself so contributes to the common good that what he hath received from the lord as not to impede others where each of himself so contributes to the common good what he hath received from the lord as not to impede others every perverter of this order fights with god by whose ordination it was established for the difference of gifts hath not proceeded from the decree of man but because the lord hath thought fit to dispense his graces in this manner or prophecy he now adduces certain gifts for the purpose of exemplifying the truth of his statement and shows how each ought to be employed in the use of his own powers as the means for preserving his station since particular gifts are determined by their own boundaries the mere declining from such fixed limits contributes to their corruption this sentence which is a little confused ought to be arranged in the following order he that hath prophecy let him prophesy according to the analogy of faith he that hath ministry let him use it for ministering he that hath doctrine let him use it for teaching each member of the church who shall keep his attention fixed on this as his mark to be aimed at will confine himself within his own proper limits this passage however is understood in various senses for some mean by prophecy the power of prediction which flourished in the church at its commencement as the lord was at that time desirous by every possible means to commend the dignity and excellence of his kingdom and what is added according to the proportion of faith they consider ought to be referred to all the clauses but i prefer the opinion of those commentators who take the word in a more extended sense and apply it to the peculiar gift of explaining revelation according as any one executes with skill and dexterity the office of an interpreter in declaring the will of god prophecy therefore at this period is nothing else in the christian church than the proper understanding of scripture and a peculiar faculty of explaining the same since all the ancient prophecies and all the oracles of god were contained in christ and his gospel for paul understood it in this sense one corinthians fourteen five when he said i wish you to speak with tongues but rather that you prophesy we know in part and we prophesy in part one corinthians thirteen nine for it does not appear that paul was only desirous in this passage to recount those admirable graces by which christ ennobled his gospel at the beginning but he rather gives a statement of ordinary gifts which constantly remain in the church 
nor does the objection seem sufficiently valid that the apostle would have made this remark in vain to such characters as could not by the spirit of god call christ accursed for since in another passage one corinthians fourteen thirty two he testifies that the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets and orders the first speaker to be silent if any revelation has been made to the person sitting he may here also admonish prophets in the church to conform their prophecies to the rule of faith and not wander from the line of truth by the expression faith he means the first axioms of religion and every doctrine not corresponding to these is thus proved to be false there is less difficulty in the other clauses whoever is appointed a minister let him perform his office by ministering and let him not imagine that he is appointed to this honour on his own account but for the sake of others as if he had said let him perform his office by executing the duty of a minister properly that he may answer to his title thus also when paul afterwards recommends to teachers under the name of teaching solid edification he means let every powerful teacher know that his object is the true instruction of the church and let him only meditate on the means by which he may render the church more learned by his doctrine for he is a teacher who forms and instructs the church by the word of truth he is powerful in the word of exhortation who considers that his object is to exhort with efficacy however close an affinity and connection these officers have with each other they do not therefore cease to be various none indeed can exhort without teaching but a teacher is not immediately possessed with the power of exhorting now no prophet or teacher or exhorter can perform his office without ministering but it is sufficient if we preserve the distinction which we observed in the gifts of god and know to be calculated for maintaining church order he that giveth with simplicity from these last clauses we see a clear proof of the legitimate use of god's gifts by the words those who give paul does not mean such as bestow anything of their own possessions but deacons who preside in distributing the public property of the church by the words those who show mercy he means widows and other ministers who were appointed to take care of the sick according to the custom of the ancient church for there is a great difference between that function which is employed in laying out what is necessary for the poor and that office which is devoted to their care and management to the former he gives the character of simplicity by which without fraud or respect of persons they may faithfully distribute what is entrusted to their care to the latter he gives the advice of showing mercy with cheerfulness that they may not by their moroseness which frequently happens diminish the kindness of their attention to the afflicted for as nothing affords more consolation to a patient or to any child of distress than the cheerfulness and alacrity of their attendants in affording assistance so on the other hand the gloomy countenances of friends servants or nurses seem to rebuke the sufferers although paul by rulers properly means elders to whom the government of the church was entrusted who were appointed to preside to rule and watch over the moral conduct of the members of the church yet it may be universally extended to every kind of ruler and governor for no small care is required from those on whom the security of all devolves no trifling assiduity is expected from such as have to devote their nights and days to the safety of the whole church the period when our apostle wrote clearly proves that he did not speak of certain civil rulers for at that time there were no pious magistrates but of elders appointed to act as censors of moral conduct let love be without dissimulation abhor that which is evil cleave to that which is good be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honour preferring one another not slothful in business fervent in spirit serving the lord rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation continuing instant in prayer distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality let love paul intending now to treat of particular duties commences very properly with love the bond of perfection he enjoins a principle which is most necessary to be observed with respect to the commencement of this duty namely pure sincerity of mind and the removal of all guile and pretence from the heart for it is difficult to give a view of the ingenuity with which a large portion of mankind assume the appearance of that love which they really do not possess for they not only deceive others but impose upon themselves while they endeavour to believe that they entertain a very considerable share of love even for those whom they not only treat with neglect but in reality renounce and despise paul therefore declares that only to be genuine love which is free from all dissimulation and guile 
and every person can best judge for himself whether he entertains any feeling in the innermost recesses of his heart opposed to this noble and lasting affection the words following in the context good and evil have not a general meaning but by evil is intended that malicious iniquity which injures any person and good that kindness by which are afforded to others aid and assistance the antithesis very frequently occurs in scripture where vices are first prohibited and virtues afterwards commended i have neither followed erasmus nor the ancient interpreter in translating the participle hating for i think paul wished to convey the idea of abhorrence as opposed by antithesis not merely to benevolence but to the steadfast and warm attachment of a friend by brotherly love he can find no words sufficiently strong for expressing the ardour of that affection with which we ought to embrace each other for he calls it brotherly love and uses a greek word which signifies the mutual endearment that exists among relations and this is indeed the character of the affection which we ought to entertain for the sons of god the following precept is very necessary for preserving benevolence that each in honour prefers his brother to himself for no poison more efficaciously contributes to alienate the affections than the idea of our being despised and treated with contempt i do not altogether disapprove of the explanation that honour means every act of friendly kindness but the first interpretation which confines it to respect meets my approbation for as nothing is more opposed to brotherly concord than contempt arising from pride by which a person exalts his own character and treats others with indifference neglect or disdain so modesty by which due honour is paid to every one nourishes and supports love with the longest continuance and greatest power not slothful in business this precept is given because the life of a christian ought not only to be active but neglecting what may contribute merely to our own advantage we ought to devote our exertions to the promoting of the good of our brethren nor are we always to direct our attention to the virtuous but we must often use our utmost efforts for the most ungrateful and worthless finally because most duties can be performed only by an entire forgetfulness of ourselves we will never be properly prepared for our attendance on christ unless we urge ourselves forward to execute the office assigned us and labour with diligence to shake off all slothfulness and indolence paul by adding fervent in spirit shows how we may gain this excellence for the flesh like the ass is always torpid and therefore requires goads because it is the fervour of the spirit alone which corrects our sluggishness and on this account earnestness in doing good requires a zeal and ardour lighted up in our breasts by the spirit of god why then some may say does paul exhort us to this fervour i answer though it is the gift of god yet the faithful are enjoined these duties that they may shake off all torpor and fan the flame which is lighted up in their hearts from heaven for it frequently happens that the impulse of the spirit is suffocated and extinguished by our own fault the third advice serving the time pertains also to the same subject for as our course of life is short our opportunity for doing good soon passes away and on this account we ought to hasten with greater alacrity for the performance of our duty thus paul orders us in another passage to redeem the time because the days are evil it may also mean that we should know how to suit ourselves to a favourable opportunity for the instant seizing of a proper juncture for action is of very great importance paul however in this sentence appears to me to oppose serving the time to habits of procrastination and loitering besides as in many ancient copies this sentence is serving the lord although it may appear at first view foreign to the context yet i dare not entirely reject this reading if it is approved i doubt not but paul wished to refer to the worship of god those kind offices and other actions which we perform to our brethren for the purposes of nourishing our love as a means to increase the courage of the faithful rejoicing in hope these three are united together and seem in some measure to relate to the former sentence serving the time for he best suits himself to time and makes a proper use of the opportunity for pursuing his christian course with vigour who places his joy in the hope of a future life and endures tribulations with patience in whatever sense this passage may be understood for it does not make much difference whether you consider it to be joined with the preceding context or separated from it paul in the first place forbids us to rest on present blessings 
and to fix our joy in earth and earthly things as if our happiness were launched there but he orders us secondly to raise our minds to heaven where we shall be made partakers of a solid and perfect joy if our joy shall consist in the hope of a future life we shall thence experience patience in adversity because no sense of pain will be able to weigh down our heavenly joy these two therefore are mutually joined together joy which is conceived from the hope of future blessedness and patience in adversity for no child of adam will submit to bear the cross with a placid and quiet mind who has not learnt to seek his happiness from a source wholly independent of the world that he may mitigate and alleviate the bitterness of the cross by the consolations which are inspired by the sure hope of an immortal crown but since a patient enduring of the cross and steady hopes of our heavenly crown very much surpass our own strength we ought to be instant in prayer and unceasingly supplicate god not to suffer our minds to faint be dejected or broken down by any events in providence even the most disagreeable and disastrous paul also not only excites us to prayer but expressly requires perseverance because our warfare is unceasing and we are daily attacked by various assaults which champions even of the greatest bravery are unable to support without an occasional supply of new vigour unceasing continuance in prayer is the best remedy against fatigue for the necessities of the saints paul returns the duties of charity and the chief of these consists in performing acts of kindness to those destitute human beings from whom we expect to receive the least remuneration since therefore those are generally most treated with contempt who are more oppressed with the load of poverty than others and on this account require greater and more immediate assistance because benefits conferred upon such indigents are considered to be entirely thrown away the god of mercy commends these applicants to our care in a peculiar manner for then finally we prove the sincerity of our love when we assist our brethren without having any other view than the exercise of our kindness now hospitality namely the benevolence and liberality which are shown to strangers may justly be considered not the last kind of charity because these objects of mercy are the most destitute of all on account of their distance from relatives and paul therefore expressly recommends to us so important a duty we see therefore that we ought to watch over every person with greater care in proportion as he is generally more neglected by the rest of our fellow-men observe also the propriety of the expression communicating to the necessities of the saints and the apostle thus intimates that we ought to supply the wants of our brethren with as much care as if we were assisting ourselves the apostle particularly commands us to assist the saints for although our charity ought to extend itself to the whole human race yet we ought to embrace with singular affection those of the household of faith who are bound to us by a still closer tie bless them which persecute you bless and curse not rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep be of the same mind one toward another mind not high things but condescend to men of low estate be not wise in your own conceits bless i am desirous to make once for all this remark to the reader not to seek with too much exactness for a certain order in particular precepts but to rest satisfied with having a few brief exhortations interspersed in this part of the epistle for forming the whole course of our life to piety and virtue and these too derived from the principle in the beginning of the chapter he will immediately give us precepts against retaliating injuries inflicted upon us by others in this passage paul requires a train of conduct yet more difficult not to pray for evil and curses to light on the heads of our enemies but to wish them every kind of prosperity and supplicate god to grant them every blessing however much they may harass and treat us with the most barbarous inhumanity we ought to labour after the attainment of this mildness with the more intense diligence in proportion to the difficulty of its attainment for our heavenly father gives no command which he does not require us to obey nor is any excuse to be admitted if we do not attain that feeling and disposition by which god wishes us to be distinguished from wicked and worldly characters i grant it is difficult and entirely contrary to human nature but there is no duty however arduous which cannot be performed by the powerful aid of god nor will he ever withhold his divine grace provided we do not neglect to pray for it with ardent and incessant supplication and though you can scarcely find one who has made such distinguished advancement in the divine law as fully to perform that commandment yet none can boast himself to be a son of god or glory in the name of a christian who has not in part put on this mind which was in the lord jesus 
and does not daily wrestle against and oppose the feeling of enmity and hatred. Prayer for our enemies is more difficult than to refrain from the active revenging of an injury which we have suffered, for there are some characters who, notwithstanding they hold their hands from violence, and are not driven on by a desire of injuring their enemies, would still be glad to find destruction or loss befall them from another quarter. Even if the injured are so much appeased as to wish no evil to their foes, yet scarce one in a hundred desires the safety and prosperity of the injurer. A large portion of mankind has immediate recourse without feeling any shame to horrid imprecations. But God, by his word, not only restrains our hands from any act of violence and injury, but also subdues all bitter feelings in our hearts. Nay, he even desires us to be solicitous for the eternal salvation of those who bring ruin on themselves by cruelly harassing us in an unjust manner. Erasmus was mistaken in the word bless, for he did not observe that it was opposed to railing and curses. Paul wishes God to be a witness of our patience, that we may not only bridle in the first place the violence of anger and indignation in our curses, but, by urgently praying for the forgiveness of our enemies, may prove our sorrow for the state and condition of such foes as cause their own voluntary destruction. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. This general exhortation is here very properly introduced, that believers may embrace each other with mutual affection, and participate together in the common events allotted them by providence. In the first place, however, Paul enumerates the parts or kinds of our duty, namely, to rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. For such is the nature of true and genuine Christian love, that it would rather grieve with a brother, when weighed down with the load of poverty and affliction, than turn aside from the wailings of sorrow, or disregard in the midst of its own delicacies, its own ease, or its own security, the moanings of distress. It is, in fine, our duty to accommodate each other as far as we possibly can, and in every circumstance of life to cultivate a reciprocal fellow-feeling, whether we have to condole with our brother in the cold blasts of adversity, or rejoice with them when basking in the sunshine of prosperity. Envy alone prevents us from rejoicing with a brother in his happiness, and the most barbarous inhumanity from sorrowing with him in his distress. Let us therefore cultivate that sympathy with each other, which may make us at the same time mutually harmonize in all our affections. Not thinking, etc. The Greek preserves the antithesis more completely. Not thinking of high things, by which he means that a Christian ought not to aspire in an ambitious manner after those things by which he may surpass others, nor indulge haughty feelings, but meditate rather upon modesty and meekness, for our excellence in the presence of God consists in these virtues, not in pride or the contempt of our brethren. This precept is properly added to the former, for nothing breaks the unity mentioned by the Apostle more completely than the exalting of ourselves, and our aspiring to something still more elevated, with a view to attain a higher situation. I take the word humble in the neuter gender, that the antithesis may be more complete. Every feeling of ambition, therefore, and every elevation of mind, which insinuate themselves under the name magnanimity, are here condemned by Paul, because moderation, or rather submission, is the chief virtue of the faithful, which is distinguished by readily yielding an honour to another, and not depriving him of his proper glory. The sentence, Be not wise in your own conceits, connects with the preceding part of the context, for nothing inflates the mind more than a high opinion of our own wisdom and prudence. He is desirous, therefore, that we relinquish this, listen to the opinions of others, and yield to their counsels. For the translation arrogant, adopted by Erasmus, is forced and unmeaning, because Paul would, in this case, repeat the same idea twice, without additional emphasis. We ought also ever to remember that one of the best remedies of arrogance is not to entertain too high an opinion of our own wisdom. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Recompense to no man evil. This prohibition differs almost nothing from the following one in the nineteenth verse, except that vengeance implies something more violent than that kind of recompensing evil which is treated of in this passage. For we sometimes render evil for evil, even when we do not demand retaliation as if we treat those maliciously from whom we receive no act of kindness. For we are accustomed to value the merits of every one towards us, or at least their claims of meriting anything at our hands, 
that we may bestow our kind offices on those from whom we have either already received an obligation or expect some future favour again if any one denies us succour in our need by paying him according to the proverb in his own coin when our aid is required we shall afford him no more assistance than we have received there are also other examples of the same kind by which evil is returned for evil without manifest revenge provide things honest i do not object to erasmus's translation preparing in a provident manner but i prefer a literal translation because although every one is intent upon his own advantage with an eagerness surpassing the bounds of equity or is cautious in avoiding losses yet paul seems to require a care and attention altogether different the whole amount of his observations is that we should use our utmost exertions to edify all by our probity for as it is necessary for us to enjoy innocence of conscience before god so we ought to have a character distinguished for integrity among men for if god ought to be glorified by our good works he is deprived of this glory when men behold nothing in us worthy of praise nor is the glory of god only obscured but he is dishonoured for all our sins are brought forward by the ignorant to the disgrace of the gospel but when we are ordered to provide things honest in the sight of all men we must regard the design and end our design is not to secure the regard and praises of our fellow men for christ warns us with much earnestness against such a design when he orders us to exclude men from beholding our good deeds and to admit god only as a witness but our object is to make men direct their attention to god and praise him that they may be roused by our example to the diligent pursuit of justice and be allured by the amiableness and excellence of our life and conversation to the love of god if we are defamed on account of the name of christ we do not cease to provide things honest among our fellow-men but the passage of corinthians as lying and yet true two corinthians six nine is fulfilled in our case if it be possible as much as lieth in you calmness and hence a composed manner of living which renders us amiable to all are no common endowments of a christian if we are desirous to pursue this we ought not only to be endowed with the greatest equity but the highest courteousness and easiness of manners which may not only gain the affections of the just and good but influence the minds of the wicked for a caution is necessary in this instance not so to affect the securing of the favour and esteem of men as to refuse to incur for the sake of christ the hatred of any human being when necessary yet we observe some who while they are worthy of being loved by all on account of the sweetness of their manners and the tranquillity of their minds yet are hated on account of the gospel even by their nearest relations easiness of disposition must not degenerate into flattery lest from our zeal to keep peace we soothe the vices of our fellow-men since therefore we cannot invariably expect to secure peace with all paul has added two sentences as exceptions if it be possible and as much as lieth in you we must resolve that according to the duties required by piety and love we ought never to violate peace unless compelled by one or other of these two causes for we ought to endure many things with an earnest desire for peace to forgive offences and kindly to remit the utmost rigour of justice that we may be always courageous as often as necessity requires to carry on our christian warfare with keenness and vigour for the friends of jesus cannot possibly enjoy eternal peace with the world which is under the dominion of satan dearly beloved avenge not yourselves the evil here corrected as hinted above is greater than the former already stated yet both spring from the same source namely an immoderate love of ourselves and innate pride which makes us indulgent to our own vices while we are inexorable to those of others since therefore this disease generally produces in all a furious desire for vengeance when we are in the least touched paul here commands us not to attempt to revenge ourselves but to give it into the hands of the lord and because such as have been once seized with this unruly passion cannot easily be curbed he uses a kind expression to retain us in the performance of our duty by calling us beloved the precept is neither to avenge nor to desire to avenge any injuries which we have received and the reason is added because we must give place unto wrath we mean by giving place unto wrath to grant the lord the power of judging and he is deprived of this by all self-avengers if therefore it is criminal to usurp the place of god we are not allowed to revenge ourselves because we anticipate the judgment of the most high who has expressed it to be his will to preserve for himself the execution of this office 
At the same time, it is intimated that God will avenge those who patiently wait for his assistance, and such as preoccupy this office, leave no room for his aid and succour. Not only does Paul prohibit us from executing vengeance with our own power, but we are not to indulge such a desire in our hearts, and on this ground any distinction between private and public vengeance is altogether vain and frivolous, for that person is no more to be excused who implores the aid of the magistrate with a malevolent intention and with a determined resolution to revenge than we can acquit the voluntary contriver of plans for self-revenge. Nay, we ought not always to ask God, as will afterwards appear, to avenge us, for if our requests for this purpose arise from private affection and passion, and not from the pure zeal of the Spirit, we do not make God our judge, but a servant of our depraved desires. We are not, therefore, to give place to wrath in any other way than by patiently waiting for the proper season for deliverance, wishing and praying in the meantime, that such as now vex and disquiet us may become our friends by repentance." for it is written, Vengeance is mine. He adduces his proof from the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32.35, where the Lord threatens to avenge his enemies, and all God's enemies are such as torment his servants without any cause. He who touches you, he says, touches the apple of mine eye. Let us therefore rest content with this consolation, that such as cause us uneasiness when we do not deserve it, will not escape unpunished, nor will we by suffering make ourselves more liable to the injuries of the wicked, but rather will afford opportunity to the Lord, our only avenger and deliverer, to grant us assistance. We ought not indeed to supplicate God to avenge our enemies, but should pray for their conversion, that they may become our friends, and if they pursue their wicked career, they will experience the same judgment which other despisers of God may expect. Nor does Paul cite this testimony as if we might indulge in anger immediately after we have been injured, and according to the natural desire of the flesh, to pray to God to avenge our injuries. But in the first place he teaches us that it is not our duty to demand vengeance unless we wish to arrogate to ourselves the part belonging to the fountain of all justice. He secondly intimates that we have no cause to fear the insulting ferocity of the wicked if they see us bearing their treatment with patience, because God does not assume to himself without effect the office of revenging our cause. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him, if he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, he now shows how we may truly perform the precepts against revenge and against the recompensing of evil, namely by not only refraining from the infliction of any injury, but also by performing acts of kindness to those who have shown us such treatment for it is a certain kind of indirect retaliation on our parts when we prevent those who have injured us from receiving a kindness. We must understand all kinds of good offices to be implied by the expression meat and drink. To the greatest extent of your power and in every transaction, assist your enemy either by riches or counsel or labour. He does not confine the term enemy to those who are hated by us, but includes also such as are engaged against us in actual strife and variance and if they are to be assisted by acts of kindness with respect to wants of a temporal nature surely their eternal salvation ought never to be opposed by our imprecations heap coals of fire paul shows the advantages we may derive from performing offices of humanity to our enemies since we do not willingly throw away both our cost and pains some interpret coals to mean the destruction heaped upon the head of an enemy if we treat the unworthy with kindness and conduct ourselves very differently from what they deserved at our hands since we will thus double the guilt of our enemy others understand by this expression that such kind treatment will excite mutual love in the breast of our adversary i take it in a more simple sense that his mind will be broken by one of two ways for our enemies will either be softened by kindnesses or if his atrocious disposition is not made more mild he will be grieved and troubled from the testimony of his conscience feeling itself confounded and overwhelmed with our goodness be not overcome of evil this precept seems to be given for the purpose of confirming his position we have to contend with the most perverse dispositions if we endeavour to retaliate we confess ourselves to be conquered if on the contrary we render good for evil we display by such conduct an invincible constancy of mind and this is truly the most beautiful and glorious kind of victory and its advantage is not only imagined but in reality felt since the lord grants the most desirable success that can be conceived to their patience 
on the contrary whoever shall endeavour to overcome evil by evil will perhaps by his wickedness overcome his enemy but it will be to his own ruin for by pursuing such a line of conduct he is fighting under the banners of satan End of section eighteen. Section nineteen of a commentary on the Epistle to the Romans by John Calvin, translated by Francis Sibson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Romans thirteen verses one to fourteen. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God the powers that be are ordained of god whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of god and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation let every soul etc the diligence and accuracy with which paul treats the subject of obedience to rulers in his instructions concerning the life and moral conduct of a christian evidently proves him to have been compelled to it by some urgent necessity and this since it is invariably connected with the preaching of the gospel could be pointed out with the greatest advantage during the first age of the church for there always exist rebellious spirits who believe that the kingdom of christ can only attain its proper exaltation and supremacy by the abolition of all earthly dominions and that the liberty which christ has purchased for them can only be enjoyed when they have shaken off every yoke of human slavery the jewish converts however were more under the influence of this error than any other nation because they regarded it as very disreputable for abraham's descendants whose kingdom had been in a most flourishing state before the coming of the redeemer to continue in bondage after his appearing another circumstance also alienated the jews as well as the gentiles from their rulers because governors then not merely hated piety but persecuted religion with the most hostile disposition believers considered it therefore absurd to acknowledge those as lawful masters and princes who were contriving to wrest and to take away the kingdom by force from christ the only lord of heaven and earth these reasons in all probability induced paul to confirm the power of the magistrates with more earnest care and diligence in the first place paul lays down a general precept which comprehends the sum of what he intended to say in the second part he subjoins such circumstances as are calculated to explain and prove the precept he denominates those higher powers not supreme because they exceed the rest of their fellow-men though they had not obtained the highest authorities they are denominated magistrates on account of their relation to those who were subject to their command and not from any comparative superiority which existed between the different governors themselves in my opinion the great object of the apostle in adopting this expression was to remove the frivolous curiosity of those who frequently propose the question by what right rulers have attained their power while we ought to rest satisfied with the dignity of their station for they had not acquired this rank by their own virtue but had ascended their distinguished eminence by the hand of the lord paul removes by mentioning every soul all kinds of exceptions so that none can claim an immunity from a common obedience for there is no power but of god our subjection to magistrates ought to rest upon their appointment by the divine administration and if it is the will of god to govern the world in this manner the despisers of power endeavour to invert the divine order and resist therefore god himself since to contemn the providence of the author of political right and power is to wage war with omnipotence it ought moreover to be understood that the powers of magistrates are from god not as the pestilence and famine and war and other punishments of sinners are said to be from him but because he has appointed them for the lawful and right government of the world for although tyrannies unjust despotisms and usurpations being full of anarchy are not to be considered as regular governments yet the very right of empire and of dominion is appointed by god for the safety of the human race since therefore rulers are allowed to protect from war and to seek remedies for injuries and mischiefs the apostle commands us freely and of our own accord to regard reverence and honour the power and dominion of magistrates as useful for mankind for the punishments inflicted by god upon the sins of men are not properly denominated administrations but those means are so called which are expressly appointed by the great ruler of the world for the preservation of legitimate order but they that resist paul threatens punishment to all those who oppose the providence of god in this matter because none can resist omnipotence but to his own ruin we ought therefore to act with great caution that we may not rush upon this divine threatening 
nor do i confine the meaning of the word damnation to that punishment only which is inflicted by magistrates as if the design of the apostle was to show that rebels against authority will be punished according to law but every kind of divine vengeance in whatever manner it may be exacted for he in general teaches us what end awaits those who enter into a contest with god for rulers are not a terror to good works but to the evil wilt thou then not be afraid of the power do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same for he is the minister of god to thee for good but if thou do that which is evil be afraid for he beareth not the sword in vain for he is the minister of god a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil for rulers he now commends to us the honouring of princes on account of their usefulness the illative particle for must therefore be referred to the first proposition not the following sentence the lord was desirous by establishing magistrates to provide for the tranquillity of the good and to check and restrain the frowardness of the bad and the safety of the human race is preserved by these means for unless the fury of the wicked is opposed and protection afforded to the innocent from the unbridled passions and desires of the disobedient all society will immediately be involved in one common ruin if this is therefore the only remedy by which the human race can be defended and saved from destruction we ought to protect it with great diligence unless we are willing to avow ourselves the public enemies of the human race the additional remark wilt thou then not be afraid of the power do that which is good intimates we have no ground for abhorring magistrates if we spend a life of virtue nay any person by the very desire to shake off or remove the yoke from himself affords a tacit proof of a wicked conscience engaged in plotting some evil paul here speaks of the true and genuine duty of the magistrate and notwithstanding many rulers frequently degenerate from this character we ought always to show them the obedience due to governors for if a bad prince is the scourge of the lord for the purpose of punishing the people's sins we ought to consider our vices to be the cause why this great blessing of the lord is changed to be our curse let us never cease therefore to stand in awe of this good appointment or ordinance of god and this we shall easily accomplish if we impute all the evil to be found in it to ourselves we here see god's design in the appointment or establishing of magistrates and its effects would always appear if so excellent and valuable an institution were not corrupted by our own faults besides princes never so much abuse their power by harassing the virtuous and the innocent as not to retain in their despotic rule some semblance of just government no tyranny therefore can exist which is not in some measure of use in affording protection to human society paul has also distinguished two parts considered by philosophers to constitute the well-ordered government of a state namely the rewards bestowed on good men and the punishments inflicted upon the wicked the word praise according to the hebrew idiom is taken in an extensive sense for he is a minister of god to thee for good magistrates may hence learn the nature of their own calling for they do not exercise dominion on their own account but for the public good nor is their power unbridled but restricted to the welfare of others in fine they are under an engagement in the execution of their sovereignty both to god and man for as god's ambassadors and transactors of his affairs they must necessarily render him an account besides the very ministry entrusted to them has a regard to their subjects to whom on this account they are debtors private men are admonished that the divine kindness protects them by the sword of princes against the injuries of the wicked for he beareth not the sword in vain another part of the office of rulers consists in restraining by force the unruly inclinations of the wicked towards the commission of vice when of their own accord they do not suffer themselves to be governed by laws and magistrates afflict upon their crimes those punishments which the judgments of god demand for he expressly declares that they are armed with the sword not merely for vain show but for the punishment of evildoers an avenger to execute wrath implies the same meaning as an executor of god's indignation the use of the sword which is put into their hands by the lord proves the truth of this position a striking passage for establishing the power of the sword because if the lord when the sword was entrusted by him to the magistrate also ordered the rulers to use it he obeys the commands of the governor of the world as often as he inflicts capital punishment on the wicked by exercising the vengeance of god all those who consider it a wicked act to shed the blood of the guilty contend with the power of god himself wherefore he must needs be subject not only for wrath but also for conscience's sake for for this cause pay ye tribute also 
for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. Wherefore ye must needs be subject. Paul now repeats the command given in the commencement concerning obedience to magistrates, as an inference, with this illustration and improvement, that they must be obeyed both on account of the necessity imposed by man and in compliance with god he mentioned wrath for the vengeance which magistrates can demand on account of the contempt shown their dignity implies that we must not yield them obedience because we may not be permitted to resist with impunity men armed and in power as we generally endure injuries which we have no means of repulsing but our submission must be voluntarily undergone and our conscience is obligated to the performance of this duty by the word of god if therefore we had it in our power to provoke and despise with impunity a magistrate when unarmed we are no more allowed to attempt it than if we perceive the punishment immediately hanging over our heads for it is not the duty of a private man to refuse obedience to a magistrate put in authority over us by the lord the whole of this discussion and inquiry relates to civil government those therefore who exercise dominion over their conscience endeavour without effect to establish by this text their sacrilegious tyranny for for this cause pay ye tribute also he deduces on this occasion where he makes mention of tributes the reason for their being established from the very office of magistrates for if their duty is to defend and preserve uninjured the tranquillity of the virtuous and to oppose themselves to the abandoned attempts of the wicked such an object can only be accomplished when they are aided by power and firm protection tributes therefore are paid by law for supporting such necessary expenses but this is not a proper place for entering upon a more full discussion concerning the manner of collecting and using taxes or tributes nor is it our duty either to prescribe to princes how much they ought to expend for individual purposes or to call them to account it becomes governors at the same time to remember all their possessions from the people are to be regarded as a public benefit not an instrument of inordinate desire and luxury for we see the purposes on account of which tributes when paid must be used according to paul namely that kings may be supplied with assistance for the defence of their subjects render therefore to all their dues the apostle appears to intend to give here a comprehensive summary of the duties owing by subjects to their rulers namely to regard and honour them to obey their edicts laws and sentences and to pay tributes and taxes obedience is intended by the word fear customs excise and all other imposts are included under the expressions taxes and tributes this passage confirms what he mentioned before that kings and other rulers deserve to be obeyed not from compulsion but because obedience is pleasing to god for he does not wish them to be feared but reverenced with voluntary esteem and honour owe no man anything but to love one another for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law for this thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not kill thou shalt not steal thou shalt not bear false witness thou shalt not covet and if there be any other commandment it is briefly comprehended in this saying thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself love worketh no ill to his neighbour therefore love is the fulfilling of the law o no man anything some consider this to be taken ironically as if paul answered the objection of those who contended that christians were burdened by enjoining them any other precepts than those of love i do not deny that it may be taken in the following ironical sense i accede to the demand of such as admit only the law of love i prefer however understanding it in a simple sense for i think paul wished to refer the precept concerning the power of the magistrates to the law of love that none might consider it weak as if he had said when i request your obedience to magistrates i require only what all christians ought to perform according to the law of love for if you are desirous for virtuous men to prosper and not to desire this would be contrary to the feelings of humanity you ought to study and zealously to labour to give validity to the laws and statutes that the people may be obedient to the guardians and protectors of the laws by whose blessing and favour the tranquillity of all is secured charity therefore is violated by the introducers of anarchy which is immediately followed by the confusion and disturbance of all establishments for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law 
Paul's plan is to reduce all the commandments of the law to love, that we may be assured of our obedience to the commands being conducted in a proper manner when love is maintained, and we should be prepared to undergo any burden by which the law of charity may be preserved entire and unbroken. The precepts already given concerning obedience to magistrates, in which no small part of love consists, are thus strongly confirmed by Paul. Some feel a difficulty in this passage which they cannot easily solve, because the love of our neighbour is taught by Paul to be the fulfilling of the law, since no mention is in this case made of the love of God, which ought on no account to be omitted. Paul, however, is not considering the whole law, but only our duties towards our neighbours. It is indeed true that the whole law is fulfilled when we love our neighbour, for true love to men springs only from a love to God, and is an evidence and effect of this excellent grace. Paul's inquiry here relates only to the second table, and his observations are confined to it alone, as if he had said, the person who loves his neighbour as himself has discharged his duty to the whole world. The cavil of those sophists who endeavour to prove justification by works from this passage is truly nugatory and impertinent, vain and trifling. For Paul is not speaking here of man's ability to perform the law or not, but states a condition which is nowhere fulfilled and obeyed. We do not deny the observance of the law to be true righteousness, when it is said men are not justified by works, but since none either have performed the law or can do it, we say all are excluded from salvation by its obedience, and our only refuge is in the grace of Christ. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. We cannot hence infer what precepts are contained in the second table, since he subjoins in the conclusion, and if there is any other precept. It may appear absurd for Paul to omit the precept concerning the honour due to parents, which had the greatest reference to the subject in hand. May not the apostle have observed this silence for the very purpose of not obscuring his argument? And though I dare not assert this, yet I find nothing wanting to complete his object, that, if God's whole design by his precepts was only to instruct us in the duty of love, we ought to use every exertion by which this might be obtained. Every enemy of contention must readily grant that Paul, by such passages as this, was desirous to prove that the whole tendency of the law is to induce us to cultivate mutual love with each other, and we must therefore supply what he passed over in silence, that obedience towards magistrates is not one of the least important parts of a duty by which peace is cherished and brotherly love preserved. Love worketh no ill to his neighbour. He proves from the effect that love contains everything delivered in the commandments, since every one, influenced by true love, will never think of injuring his neighbour. For what else does the whole law forbid than our doing no injury to our neighbour? We ought also to adapt this to the present purpose of the Apostle, for, since magistrates are the guardians of peace and equity, every one desireth to preserve the right of each individual in the state inviolate, and to protect the lives of all from injury, must defend, to the utmost of his power, the rank of magistrates. The enemies, indeed, of government display their desire for doing injury. His repetition of the passage, love is the fulfilling of the law, must, as before, be understood to relate to that part which regards human society, for no allusion is here made to the first table of the law, which is wholly devoted to the worship of God. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armour of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh, to fulfil the lusts thereof. And that. He now enters upon another subject of exhortation, for since the rays of heavenly light have now begun to shine upon us, towards the dawn of day, we ought to imitate the conduct of those who are employed in the midst of light, and in the presence of their fellow men. For they take diligent care not to perpetrate any base or dishonourable action, since they are assured, by committing any kind of offence, they will be exposed to the observation of too great a number of witnesses. But it much more becomes us, who always stand in the presence of God and of angels, and are invited by Christ, the true Son of Righteousness, to behold Himself, to avoid every kind of shameful conduct. The sum of the whole amounts to this— since a proper season, as we well know, has now arrived for our rising from sleep, let us cast away everything pertaining to the night. 
let us shake off all the works of darkness because darkness itself is already dispersed and devoting ourselves to the works of light let us walk as we ought to do in the day the intervening part of the sentence for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed ought to be enclosed in a parenthesis as this is an allegory we will carefully examine the meaning of each part paul means by night ignorance of god and all who are kept in it wander and sleep as in the night for unbelievers suffer from blindness and stupidity and this last is indicated by sleep which is the image as the apostle says of death the revelation of divine truth by which christ the son of righteousness rises upon us is termed light rising means to be girt and prepared for the performance of those offices of obedience which the lord requires from us believers works of darkness indicate base and flagitious actions because night according to the apostle is free from a sense of shame the armour of light implies honourable sober and chaste actions to which the day is usually devoted and arms are mentioned rather than works because we must serve as soldiers under the lord the sentence and that at the beginning must be read by itself for it depends upon the former doctrine and means besides what has been already mentioned paul says the time is known to the faithful because the vocation of god and the day of visitation require newness of life and manners as he afterwards by way of explanation makes it to be the hour of rising the greek word for time signifies occasion or opportunity for now is our salvation nearer this passage is variously tortured by interpreters many refer the word believing to the time of the law as if paul had said the jews had believed before christ appeared which i reject as harsh and strained and it would be absurd to restrict a general doctrine to a small part of the church how few of the whole church to which he wrote were jews this language would not suit the romans the comparison of the day and night in my opinion removes this difficulty the sentence our salvation is now nearer than when we began to believe refers to the time preceding their faith for since the adverb admits of a doubtful signification this as appears from the following remarks is a much more proper sense of the passage the night is far spent the day is at hand this is the occasion mentioned for although the faithful were not now received into the full light of day yet he justly compares our knowledge of a future life which shines upon us by the gospel to the dawn of day for this day is not taken as in other places for the light of faith in which case he would not have said that it approached but it was actually present nay was even now shining as in the midst of its progress but relates to the happy splendour of the heavenly life whose commencement is now discovered by the gospel to recapitulate the whole we ought from the very moment when god begins to call us to direct our attention to the coming of christ as from the first rising of the day we infer the full light of the sun to be at no great distance he says the night is far spent because we are not buried in thick darkness as unbelievers to whom not a single spark of light and life appears but the hope of resurrection is placed before us by the gospel nay the light of faith whence we obtain a knowledge of the near approach of the full splendour of heavenly glory ought to rouse our exertions and prevent us from being torpid in our earthly career but a little after where he orders us to walk in light as during the day he does not continue the same metaphor because he compares our present state in which christ shines upon us to the day but he was desirous to encourage us by various ways by meditating at one period on our future life and reverencing at another the presence of the light of god not in rioting paul hath here mentioned three kinds of vices each of which he has distinguished by two names intemperance and luxury in our manner of living venereal desire and its consequence impure conduct envy and contention if these actions are attended with so much disgrace that even carnal men are ashamed to perpetrate them in the presence of mankind we who walk in the light of god ought to refrain from them when we are withdrawn from the sight of all observers although strife precedes envying in the third class of vices mentioned by paul he undoubtedly intended to teach us that contention and dispute flow from envy since every person anxious to attain great eminence feels envy towards others ambition is the cause of both these sins but put ye on the lord jesus this metaphor taken from our apparel which is calculated either to adorn or disfigure us frequently occurs in scripture a dirty and torn garment disgraces its wearer while a clean and beautiful one secures him additional regard and esteem 
to put on christ means our being surrounded and protected in every part by the virtue of his spirit and thus rendered fit for the performance of every duty of holiness for the image of god which is the only ornament of the soul is thus renewed in us for paul regards the end and design of our calling since god by adoption engrafts us into the body of his only begotten son on condition that we renounce our former manner of life and become new men in christ jesus hence the apostle says in another passage galatians three twenty seven that believers put on christ in baptism make not provision for the flesh while we carry about with us our flesh we cannot entirely neglect it for our conversation in heaven is accompanied with our earthly pilgrimage we must therefore so take care of all things pertaining to the body as to use them for affording help in our journey without making us lose sight of our heavenly country heathens themselves say the demands of nature are few the appetites of man are insatiable whoever therefore labours to gratify the desires of the flesh must not only fall into a state of dissipation but be overwhelmed in the very depths and abyss of profligacy while paul instructs us to curb our desires he assigns our want of contentment with the sober and legitimate use of what we possess as the cause of all intemperance by merely supplying therefore the wants and necessities of our faith and not our carnal lusts we shall use the present world without abusing it End of section 19. Section 20 of A Commentary on the Epistle to the Romans by John Calvin, translated by Francis Sibson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Romans 14, verses 1 to 23. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations, for one believeth that he may eat all things another who is weak eateth herbs let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not and let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth for god hath received him who art thou that judgest another man's servant to his own master he standeth or falleth yea he shall be holden up for god is able to make him stand him that is weak he now passes on to a precept very necessary for the instruction of the church that such as have made greater progress in Christian doctrine should suit themselves to the more ignorant, and bestow all their own strength for supporting the weakness of the inexperienced. For there are some of God's people weaker than others, and if they are not treated with great tenderness and clemency, they become dispirited, and are at length estranged from religion. It is probable this occurred in a very great degree in the first age of the gospel, for the churches were formed by a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, some of whom had been so long accustomed to observe the ritual of the law of moses and instructed in it from their infancy as not easily to relinquish an adherence to its ceremonies the rest who had never been taught it avoided the unaccustomed yoke but since men are readily inclined from a variety of opinions to involve themselves in disputes and controversies the apostle shows how men of such various sentiments may continue in the church without disagreement he orders it as the best method for the more strong to labour in assisting the weak, and for such as have made greater progress to bear with the ignorant. For God does not confer on us greater strength than others for enabling us to oppress the weak, nor is it the duty of Christian wisdom to become insolent beyond measure, and to despise others. In this way, therefore, he directs his conversation to such as have acquired more skill, experience, and firmness, who are more powerfully obligated to assist their neighbours, on account of their enjoying greater degrees of grace not to doubtful disputations a word is wanting to complete the sense which can signify nothing else than that the weak should not be harassed with troublesome disputes we ought to keep in mind the hypothesis now under the consideration of the apostle for since many of the jews still adhered to the shadows of the law he confesses they were faulty in doing so but requires pardon to be shown them for a short time because by pressing them with more severity their faith would only be undermined he denominates those disputations doubtful which disturb the mind not yet sufficiently settled or involve it in doubts we may however extend this farther namely to all the thorny slippery crabbed questions which disquiet and disturb weak consciences without edification we must therefore consider what questions each is able to receive and suit our doctrines to their capacities for one believes I do not understand what Erasmus has followed in the various reading he has used. 
for the sentence which is entire in the original is mutilated by his translation and instead of using the relative article he improperly adopts the following version another indeed believes there is nothing harsh or strained in taking the infinitive for the imperative as paul frequently adopts this structure he calls those believers who are fully persuaded in their conscience and allows them an indifferent use of everything the weak however only eats herbs and abstains from the use of such articles of food as he considers to be prohibited if the common reading is more approved the meaning will be that it is unfair for him who freely eats all things to try such as are tender and weak by the same rule for it is absurd to understand by weak those who are sick let not him that eateth the apostle meets both these defects in a prudent and appropriate manner the defect of such as are more strong in the faith consists in their despising nay even ridiculing those who are entangled by vain scruples as too superstitious the scrupulous on the contrary can scarcely avoid drawing hasty inferences and are disposed to condemn what they do not fully understand and to consider everything improper which is not done according to their view of the subject he warns the former to avoid contempt of their brethren and the latter not to indulge in too much niceness and scrupulosity the reason which he assigns since it suits both classes of believers applies to each member of the sentence since you behold says paul a human being being enlightened by the knowledge of god you have sufficient proof of his being received by the lord and you reject by despising or condemning such a character one whom god has embraced who are you as you would act in an uncivil nay in a proud manner by wishing to compel another man's servant to obey your laws and to regulate all his conduct according to the rule and standard of your own will so you act with too great presumption by condemning anything in a servant of god because it does not afford you pleasure for it is not your duty to prescribe what conduct he ought to pursue and what to avoid nor is it necessary for him to live according to a law which you prescribe we are not entitled to judge either of his character or conduct we ought in judging of a man's character to leave him whatever he is to the will of god his conduct must be examined by the word of god and not by the standard of our own opinion the judgment formed by the word of god is neither another's nor man's paul intends in this passage to prevent us from falling into all rashness in forming our opinions which those necessarily do who dare pronounce judgment without the word of god to his own master he standeth or falleth it is properly the power of god to disapprove or to applaud the conduct of his servant all therefore who attempt to assume this power to themselves act unjustly towards the lord by adding but he will stand he not only orders us to refrain from condemning but exhorts to clemency and humanity that we may always entertain good hopes of him in whom we behold anything of the divine character because the lord has given us cause to hope that he will fully confirm and lead on to perfection those in whom he has begun the work of his grace for he does not argue simply from the power of god as if he had said god can do it if he chooses but he unites according to scripture god's will with his power nor does he determine in this passage the necessity of their continuing as if those cannot fail abiding to the end whom god hath once raised up but he only exhorts and instructs us to entertain good hopes and to let our judgments incline to that side as he also teaches in another part of his epistles philippians one six he who hath begun a good work will finish it unto the end to conclude paul shows how the judgments of those incline in whom love is strong lively and vigorous one man esteemeth one day above another another esteemeth every day alike let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the lord and he that regardeth not the day to the lord he doth not regard it he that eateth eateth to the lord for he giveth god thanks and he that eateth not to the lord he eateth not and giveth god thanks one man esteemeth he lately spoke of religion in the choice of meats he now adds another example with regard to the difference of days and each of these was derived from judaism for when the lord distinguishes between meats in his law and pronounces some unclean and forbids the use of them when he also appoints certain festivals and solemn days and solemn days and commands them to be observed the jews who had from their infancy been instructed in the doctrine of the law could not lay aside that reverence for days which they had conceived from the beginning and to which they had been accustomed during the whole course of their lives and they dared not touch meats which had been detested for so long a period 
it was a part of their weakness to be imbued with these opinions for had they clearly and certainly understood the nature of christian liberty they would have formed different opinions it was the duty of piety to refrain from that conduct which they considered unlawful as an attempt to do anything which was opposed to their own conscience would have proceeded from rashness and contempt the apostle in this instance adopts a wise moderation when he orders every one to be fixed and determined in his plan meaning that christians ought to study obedience with so much care as to do nothing which they do not think or rather are sure will please god and this principle of good living ought to be undoubtedly fixed in our minds to depend and rest upon the will and nod of god and not to allow ourselves to move a finger with a doubtful or vacillating mind for rashness will immediately proceed with rapid strides to obstinacy when we dare advance one step farther than we are permitted according to the conviction of our own conscience should the unceasing perplexity of error and the impossibility on that account of weak persons enjoying that certainty which paul requires be objected an answer is easily ready since such characters will be pardoned provided they keep themselves within their own prescribed bounds for paul was desirous merely to restrain that immoderate license by the practice of which many thrust themselves as it were by chance into a doubtful and irregular course of actions paul therefore requires us to choose the will of god which is to preside as the regulator and governor of all our conduct he that regardeth the day to the lord he regardeth it since paul was fully and certainly convinced that the observance of days proceeds from an ignorance of christ we cannot believe he would have given his entire and unqualified support of such a corruption and yet the words seem to imply that no offence is committed by the observer of days for god can accept nothing but what is good it is necessary therefore to distinguish between the opinion entertained by any one concerning the days to be observed and the observance by which he binds himself the opinion of the jewish converts is superstitious for paul grants this by condemning it under the name weakness and he will do it again soon in a more open manner but god approves of the person influenced by this superstition who does not dare to violate the solemnity of the day because a doubtful conscience has not courage to undertake anything against conviction for what could a jew do who had not yet made such a progress as to be freed from the religious observance of days the observance of days is commended in the word of the lord whose authority he grants the necessity of observance is imposed by the law and he does not yet perceive its abrogation nothing remains therefore but to wait for a more extended revelation to confine himself within the bounds of his capacity and not to enjoy the benefit of liberty before he has embraced it by faith the same opinion must be formed of him who refrains from unclean meats should he eat in such a state of doubt and perplexity he would not receive it as a benefit from the hand of god but lay his hands on things forbidden let him therefore use other things which he considers to be allowed and follow the measure of his own understanding he will thus thank the lord which he could not do were he not fully convinced that he was fed and supported by the kindness of god he is not to be despised on this account as if he gave offence to the lord by such sobriety and pious timidity nor is there any absurdity in saying the modesty of a weak man is approved of god not because he deserves approbation but by the indulgence of his heavenly father but because he lately required certainty and conviction of mind that no one might rashly and of his own will undertake the observance of any particular line of conduct with respect to days or meats we ought to consider whether the apostle does not rather exhort than affirm in this passage for the following sense agrees better with the context let every one be fully convinced of the reason of his actions for he must give an account before the divine tribunal since both in eating and refraining from food he must have a regard to the sovereign giver of all blessings certainly nothing is better calculated to restrain an improper freedom in judging or to correct superstition than to be cited before the tribunal of god and on this ground paul wisely proposes to every individual to appear before that judge to the will and beck of whom he may refer all his actions nor is this view opposed by the apostle addressing them in the affirmative for he immediately subjoins no one lives to himself and no one dies to himself where he does not state what men may do but commands what line of conduct they ought to pursue for he says that we then practise abstinence and live to the lord when we give him thanks our use of meats therefore and our abstinence from them without thanksgiving is impure we and all our actions can be sanctified by calling on the name of god alone for none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself 
For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. For none of us. He now confirms his former opinion by reasoning from a whole to a part, namely, we need not wonder if the particular actions of our life ought to have respect to the Lord, since it ought to be wholly devoted to his glory. For the life of a Christian is then conducted in a proper manner, when the whole scope of his actions is regulated by the will of God. But if all your actions ought to be referred to his will, it is altogether impious to attempt anything which you consider to be displeasing to him, nay, which you are not fully persuaded to be calculated to afford him pleasure. To live to the Lord does not signify, as in chapter 6 verse 8, to be quickened by his spirit, but to guide our conduct according to the will, pleasure, nod, and command of the Lord, and to order and regulate all things to his glory. Nor are we only to live, but die to the Lord. Both our life and death are to be surrendered to his will, and he adds the best of all reasons, because whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Whence it follows that he has power equally over our life and death. The use of this doctrine is extensive, for God's power is thus claimed over life and death, that the condition of every individual may be endured as a yoke imposed by the disposer of all events, for it is right for him to assign every one his station and course, and we are not only in this way forbidden to attempt anything hastily without a command from God, but patience is commanded us in all our troubles and inconveniences. If the flesh, therefore, at any time starts back from adversity, let us remember that a man, who is not free and master of himself, perverts all law and order if he does not depend upon the will, nod, and pleasure of his God. A rule of life and death is thus afforded us, for... If the Lord lengthens our life in the midst of continued troubles, uneasiness, and weariness, we ought not to desire to depart before our time, and should he suddenly recall us in the very flower of our age, we ought to be invariably ready and equipped for our departure. For to this end Christ both died. This affords a confirmation of the reason just assigned, with a view to prove that we must both live and die to the Lord, for he had said, We are in the power of Christ, whether we live or die. He now shows how deservedly Christ claims for himself this power over us, having purchased it for so great a price. For by undergoing death for our salvation, he acquired a dominion for himself, which could not be dissolved by death, and by rising he had a claim upon all our life as his property. By his death, therefore, and resurrection, he has merited that we should serve to the glory of his name, both in death and life. The passage he rose and revived again, signifies that a new state of life had been procured for him by his resurrection, because the life he now enjoys is not subject to change, his power and dominion over us are also eternal. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block, or an occasion to fall, in his brother's way. But why dost thou? Paul, after devoting the life and death of us all to Christ, passes on to mention the judgment conferred upon Christ by the Father with the dominion of earth and heaven. Hence he infers the unreasonable character of such boldness as usurps to itself the judgment of a brother, since by this liberty Christ the Lord is deprived of the power which he alone hath received from the Father. But by the very name of brother he particularly restrains all inordinate desire for passing judgment. For if the Lord hath determined that we should have a mutual right to brotherly society, it is our duty to preserve our equality inviolate, and every one, therefore, assuming to himself the character of a judge, will act an unreasonable part. He then recalls our attention to the only judge, from whose tribunal none has a power to escape, much less to seize upon his authority. For a Christian to take to himself the liberty of judging the conscience of a brother would be as strong a proof of absurdity, as if a criminal who ought to lie prostrate at the footstool of his judge should seize upon his tribunal. Such is nearly the argument of James, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. He who judges a brother judges the law, and is not an observer of the law but a judge, while on the contrary, he says, there is one lawgiver who can both save and destroy. The word tribunal means the power which Christ possesses of being judge, 
as the voice of the archangel by which we shall be summoned is named in another place one thessalonians four sixteen the trump for he will strike the minds and ears of all by his own awful sound for it is written as i live the apostle appears to me to have cited this testimony isaiah forty five twenty three not so much for the purpose of proving his opinion concerning the judgment of christ which was undoubtedly maintained among all christians as to show that all must expect it with humility and submission such evidently is the sense of the passage his words therefore in the first place prove that the judgment of the whole human race is in the power of christ alone he secondly here demonstrates from the expressions of the prophet that all flesh ought to be humbled in expectation of such a glorious judgment and this is signified by every knee bowing down to his majesty although the lord in this passage of the prophet predicts in general that his glory will be distinguished among all nations and his own majesty shine forth in every part of the world with splendour which was concealed at that period as in some obscure corner of the earth among a very small number of people yet if we take a narrower view of this subject it is evident this prophecy is neither fulfilled now nor ever has been nor can any hopes be entertained of its future completion god reigns at this time in the world only by his gospel nor is his majesty duly honoured in any other way than when it is made known to us in his word the word of god always had its enemies by whom it was obstinately opposed and its despisers who mocked at it as a mere fable and a subject fit only for ridicule many characters of this description exist at the present time and will continue through all ages hence it is evident this prediction commences indeed in the present life but its completion cannot take place until the day of the last resurrection shall have shone forth and christ's enemies become his footstool when the lord shall have taken his seat for judgment and on this account it is properly applied to christ's tribunal it is also a remarkable passage for confirming our faith in the eternal divinity of christ for god speaks in this passage nay the very god who has declared my glory i will not give to another isaiah forty two eight now if that is completed in christ which god there claims for himself alone the deity without doubt manifests itself in christ the truth indeed of this prophecy openly appeared at that period when christ collected for himself a people from the whole world and reduced it under the obedience of his gospel and the worship of his name paul also had this text in mind philippians two nine when he says that god had given his christ a name at which every knee should bow this will be fully manifested when he shall have ascended his tribunal to judge both the quick and dead since all judgment in heaven and earth has been given him by the father the words of the prophet are every tongue shall swear to me but since an oath is a kind of divine worship the language of paul in this verse every tongue shall confess to god conveys the same meaning for the lord intended merely to affirm that all men would not only acknowledge his name but confess their obedience to him both by their mouth and the external gesture of their body namely the bending of their knee to his authority so then every one of us this conclusion recalls us to humility and submission from which also he immediately draws the inference let us not therefore judge one another any more for we are not allowed to usurp the office of judge who are necessarily obligated to undergo the divine judgment and give an account of our conduct for the apostle indirectly points out such malignant censures as exert all their wit and talents in discovering something in the life and conversation of their brethren which they may censure he orders them therefore to adopt every cautious measure and plan because by their neglect they frequently cast their brethren over some dreadful precipice or drive them against some stumbling block by which they fall i know and am persuaded by the lord jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean to him it is unclean but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat now walkest thou not charitably destroy not him with thy meat for whom christ died let not then your good be evil spoken of for the kingdom of god is not meat and drink but righteousness and peace and joy in the holy ghost for he that in these things serveth christ is acceptable to god and approved of men i know to prevent the objection of those christians whose progress in the gospel of christ was so great that they made no distinction in meats paul just proves what opinion must be formed of meats considered in themselves and then subjoins the sin attending the circumstance of their use he declares therefore that no meat is impure to a right and pure conscience and the only impediments to our making a pure use of meats are ignorance and error for if any one imagines meat to be unclean he cannot use it freely 
he soon after adds we must not only have respect to the kind of food itself but to our brethren also before whom we eat for we ought not to consider the use of god's blessings to be so indifferent as not to be subject to the law of christian love the meaning of the apostle is the following i know all meats to be clean and on this account leave them to your own free choice i allow your conscience to be disengaged from all scruples on this head and i do not exclude you simply from the use of the meats themselves but i wish while you dismiss from your thought the mere food that you should not neglect your neighbour the word unclean means profane which is promiscuously used by the impious in opposition to those which are peculiarly sanctified for the use of a faithful people he says that he knows and is fully and undoubtedly persuaded of the cleanness and purity of all food the apostle adds in the lord jesus because his kindness and grace is the cause why all creatures are blessed to us by the lord which were otherwise cursed in adam he was however desirous at the same time to oppose the liberty granted by christ to the slavery of the law that believers might not consider themselves bound to an observance from which they had been delivered by christ his exception shows that nothing is so pure as not to be contaminated by a corrupt conscience for all our food and enjoyments are sanctified by faith alone and true piety unbelievers are inwardly polluted and infect everything by their unhallowed touch titus one fifteen but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat paul now points out the three various ways by which a brother may be offended by our use of food and temporal enjoyments love in the first place is violated if our brother is grieved for so slight a cause for it is contrary to love to be the means of plunging any one in sorrow in the second place the value of the blood of christ is neglected by wounding a weak conscience for the most contemptible of the brethren is redeemed by the blood of jesus and nothing can be more disgraceful than to destroy a brother for the mere gratification of the appetite surely we are in a dishonourable manner too much devoted to our animal gratifications if we prefer food which in itself is so very worthless to christ our redeemer the third reason is that if our saviour has purchased a valuable liberty for us we ought to use every exertion in our power to prevent our christian freedom from being justly blamed and evil spoken of by our fellow-men and this always takes place when we improperly abuse the gifts of the source of all blessings these reasons are sufficient to make us avoid offending in a rash manner our brethren by improperly indulging our liberty for the kingdom of god paul now on the other hand informs us that we may without loss abstain from the use of our liberty since the kingdom of god does not consist in these things for it is our bounden duty never to omit the performance of those duties which are calculated to raise and preserve the kingdom of god whatever offences may result from so determined and noble a conduct those disturbers of the peace of the church cannot be tolerated who might forbear the use of meat for the sake of love to their weak brethren without dishonouring god inflicting any injury on christ's kingdom or offending against the laws of genuine piety paul uses the very same arguments in the first epistle to the corinthians chapter six verse thirteen meats for the belly and the belly for meats but god shall destroy both it and them one corinthians eight eight meat commendeth us not to god for neither if we eat are we the better neither if we eat not are we the worse paul in fine wants to show that food and drink are in themselves too vile and contemptible to be made the cause of preventing the course of the gospel but righteousness and peace paul did not contrast meat and drink with these three christian graces as if he intended to enumerate all the excellencies which form the kingdom of christ but merely to show that its glory consisted in the enjoyment of spiritual blessings he has however in these few words certainly included the sum of the gospel namely our rest with god in having our consciences sprinkled with the blood of the lamb and possessing true joy by the holy spirit dwelling in us as a temple and forming us to his glory the possessor of true and genuine righteousness enjoys the highest and most inestimable blessing the peaceful joy of conscience what want or desire is felt by the believer who has peace with god peace in my opinion expresses the manner in which spiritual joy is received for in whatever state of torpid feeling or of vain exultation the reprobate may be placed true joy and cheerfulness of conscience can only be possessed by those who feel god to be reconciled and propitious to them in christ solid substantial joy is the fruit of this peace although it is the bounden duty of every believer to proclaim the spirit as the author of such invaluable gifts yet paul intended to make an allusion in this passage to the opposition which exists between the internal joys of the spirit and mere external blessings 
we may hence learn that all blessings pertaining to the kingdom of god may be enjoyed by us in the highest and most complete manner without the use of food which is required only for the maintenance and support of the body for he that in these things it follows as a necessary consequence that the kingdom of god is in a perfectly vigorous and flourishing state with respect to those believers who are accepted of god and approved by men the servant of christ who obeys his redeemer with a calm and placid conscience by means of the righteousness which is by faith commends himself both to god and man the kingdom of god is complete and entire in all its parts where righteousness peace and spiritual joy exist and it therefore does not consist in things of a mere bodily nature the obeyer of the will of the most high must be necessarily acceptable to the god of love men cannot fail to approve of the conduct of those who exhibit in their lives and conversation a clear evidence of their being guided by virtue the wicked it must be granted do not always spare the children of the king of glory nay the enemies of divine truth pour forth without the least cause or occasion the most opprobrious language against believers and defame by calumnies of their own invention men of the most blameless characters even the good actions of the pious are perverted by malignant interpretations into vices paul is here speaking concerning the judgment of sincerity and truth without any admixture of moroseness without the least spark of hatred and without the perverse statements of superstition let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another for meat destroy not the work of god all things indeed are pure but it is evil for that man who eateth with offence it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak let us therefore follow paul uses every effort to recall the attention of his readers from the mere consideration of meats to those higher and nobler attainments which ought chiefly to influence regulate and direct all our actions we should eat to live we should live to act as the servants of the lord we perform due obedience to the lord of heaven and earth when we edify our neighbour by benevolence kindness and courteousness nearly all the duties of love may be summed up in harmony union and edification to prevent his readers from undervaluing these gifts paul repeats his former opinion that corruptible meat is in itself too contemptible to be made the cause of destroying the building of the lord for we may discern the work of the lord wherever there is even the least spark of piety and the disturbers of a weak conscience by unkindness and harshness demolish this divine structure paul unites edification with peace because too great indulgence and improper compliance are frequently very destructive we ought therefore never to lose sight of the spiritual advancement of our brother and should never comply with anything unless we consider it may promote his growth in grace paul instructs us one corinthians ten twenty three all things are lawful for me but all things are not expedient and he adds the reason but all things edify not paul justly again impresses the opinion for meat destroy not and means that we ought to use abstinence in such a manner as not to injure our piety and should be careful not to eat anything which may prove an offence to a doubting brother since the kingdom of god does not consist in meats and drinks paul grants by the expressions all things indeed are pure that there is nothing unclean and the passage but it is evil for that man who eateth with offence forms an exception our apostle wishes to convey the following meaning food is indeed good but any offence caused by its use to a brother is evil food is granted to us that we may eat without doing anything contrary to the great principle of love to violate love in the use of meat pollutes what was otherwise pure the apostle hence infers that we ought to abstain from everything which may offend our brethren paul by the words stumble is offended is made weak points out the necessity of our not even causing our brother to fall of our not offending him and our avoiding everything by which he might be made weak to weaken is less than to offend and to offend than to fall the first takes place when the balance of the conscience of a brother begins to waver the second when conscience is more powerfully shaken and disturbed the third when zeal for religion is injured and the affections alienated from the cause of christ hast thou faith have it to thyself before god happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth and he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith for whatsoever is not of faith is sin hast thou faith to bring the discussion to an end paul shows in what the excellence of christian liberty consists 
and the false boasting of those is made plain and undoubted who have not learned to regulate the freedom they enjoy the apostle says that our knowledge of liberty arises from faith and has properly a respect to god the possessor of this certain and firm conviction of mind ought to rest satisfied with the calmness of his conscience in the presence of god nor is it necessary to manifest his possession of this liberty before his fellow men if therefore we offend our weak brethren by the use of flesh we undoubtedly abuse our liberty because we are not impelled to adopt such a line of conduct from any necessity this passage is evidently perverted and misunderstood when it is adduced to support the opinion that a person may observe foolish and superstitious ceremonies without danger provided his conscience is pure and undisturbed before god the context clearly confutes such a misconstruction ceremonies are established for the worship of god and are a part of our confession to detach confession from faith is to deprive the sun of his heat paul merely disputes in this passage concerning the unrestrained use of meat and drink without making any allusion to rites happy is he that condemneth not himself paul first instructs us how we may make a proper use of the gifts of god in the second place how great a barrier ignorance is for the purpose of preventing us from urging the inexperienced beyond the limits of their own weakness the general maxim happy is he who is not accused and condemned by his own conscience applies to all our actions provided we examine our conduct in a right and proper manner for many contrive and perpetrate the worst and basest of crimes without any scruple of conscience because they shut their eyes and hurry on whithersoever the blind and furious indulgence of the fleshly appetites and passions carry them without ever reflecting upon the dangers to which their virtue and happiness are exposed if we always make a broad line of demarcation between the voice of stupid ignorance and of a sound judgment that man may be pronounced happy whose conscience after a careful examination of his whole conduct does not sting him from a view of his sins his errors or his crimes a good conscience is the only security we can have that our works are pleasing to the judge of quick and dead all vain excuses alleged by many in consequence of ignorance whose errors are closely entwined and connected with sloth and apathy are thus completely set aside for if mere good intentions as they call it were sufficient all self-examination by which the spirit of god weighs and values the works and deeds of men would be vain and superfluous and he that doubteth this one expression clearly points out the line of conduct necessary to be observed by a wavering and unsteady mind doubt implies a restless alternation suspense and wavering inclination of the understanding between the various deliberations to which its attention is directed since therefore a certainty and placid security of conscience before god is the beginning of virtue and of good works nothing is more opposed to the approval of our actions after self-examination than uncertainty and trepidation of mind happy would it be for the human race if they steadily adopted the following maxim that they ought to engage in no undertaking which they did not certainly know to be agreeable to the will of infinite perfection a steady adherence to this principle would prevent men from acting in so disorderly a manner during the great part of their lives from sleeping over the task assigned them or from hurrying along with an unrestrained and blind impulse wherever they are driven by a heated imagination or a reckless spirit of enterprise lust avarice licentiousness or ambition for if we are not allowed to take a single mouthful of bread with a doubting conscience how much greater caution ought to be used in transactions of the highest importance for whatsoever is not of faith any work or action however excellent or distinguished it may appear to be provided it is not founded upon a right conscience is considered to be sin for god does not regard outward pomp and splendour but the inward obedience of the heart on this alone the whole value of our works depends what kind of obedience is his who does not engage in any transaction with a full conviction and persuasion of his enjoying the approbation of his god the least doubt of the favour of the most high deservedly convicts the agent as guilty of prevarication who purposes his mad career against the testimony of conscience faith in this place means a constant persuasion of mind and an unshaken certainty which are derived only from the truth of god uncertainty therefore and trembling doubt vitiate and spoil all our actions however splendid they may otherwise appear the pious mind since it can acquiesce with certainty in nothing else but the word of god must regard all fictitious worship and every kind of work which arise from the imaginations of men as vain and delusive to condemn whatever is not of faith is a rejection of everything that has not the support and approval of the word of god 
nor is it sufficient that our actions are approved by the word of god provided our mind depending and testing with confidence on this persuasion does not engage with the utmost diligence and alacrity in the work to which it is directed let us always remember this great principle of a holy life that our minds ought never to be placed in a state of fluctuating uncertainty but relying and resting with confidence on god's word we ought to follow with perfect security wherever he calls End of section 20. Section 21 of A Commentary on the Epistle to the Romans by John Calvin, translated by Francis Sibson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Romans 15, verses 1 to 33. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves let every one of us please his neighbour for his good to edification for even christ pleased not himself but as it is written the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me paul shows that the greatness of strength in which some believers surpassed others was conferred upon them for the purpose of their being enabled to assist the weak lest they should fall as the strong had made a greater progress therefore in the knowledge of god they had no cause to be dissatisfied because they had to undergo a heavier burden for as god intends the more enlightened and advanced in doctrine to be employed in instructing the ignorant so he entrusts to those on whom he has conferred superior strength the task of devoting their powers to the support and protection of the weak all the graces ought thus to be mutually communicated among the members of christ's body every believer therefore is laid under greater obligations to support the weak in proportion as he is endowed with greater power in christ his head Paul means, by observing that a Christian ought not to act for his own pleasure, that his zeal and labour should not be directed merely to gratify himself, as is the character of those who, resting satisfied with their own judgment, neglect others with indifference and unconcern. This advice suits very well the present subject, for nothing impedes or retards more offices of kindness and condescension to others than the mere following of selfish plans and gratifying of private affections, while the care of others is neglected in consequence of too great devotedness to self-interest let every one of us paul informs us that believers are mutually obliged to each other and it is our duty therefore to satisfy and strengthen every attention and regard and we ought to adapt ourselves without reserve or excuse to the necessities of our brethren when we can do it to their edification according to the word of god not content therefore with our own judgments and not gratifying merely our own desires we ought on all occasions and times and in all circumstances to use in the first place every exertion and leave no efforts untried for the purpose of affording our brethren every satisfaction while we are thus desirous to adapt ourselves to the wants of our neighbours we ought in the second place to keep our minds fixed on the lord and promote the spiritual edification of believers as the great end and design of all our kindness benevolence and courtesy since a large portion of mankind can only be gratified by indulging their inordinate affections if you wish to ingratiate yourself with them their folly and vices must be gratified while their eternal salvation is neglected your attention must not therefore be directed to the advancement of their spiritual welfare since they will rest satisfied with the indulgence of their destructive and ruinous propensities you must not on this account study to please those whose only gratification consists in the pursuit of iniquity and vice for even christ please not himself if it is the duty of a servant to refuse no office which his master is prepared to undergo it would be the height of absurdity for us to wish to exempt ourselves from the necessity of bearing the weaknesses of others to which christ submitted in whom we glory as our lord and king for he laid aside all regard to himself and devoted all his time his talents his influence and zeal to the lost race of adam the whole of the ninth verse of the sixty-ninth psalm applies to christ for the zeal of God's house hath eaten him up, and the reproaches of them that reproached God have fallen upon him. Christ, it hence appears, glowed with so great a fervour for the glory of God, and was influenced and impressed with so great a desire for advancing the kingdom of the Lord of hosts, as to forget himself and to be lost and absorbed in this one thought and feeling. The Messiah so completely devoted himself to the Lord that his mind was pierced with grief as often as he beheld the sacred name of God reproached by wicked men the second part of the verse which relates to the reproaches of god admits of two senses 
it may either imply that christ was as much affected with the reproaches cast upon god as if he had been reproached in his own person or he felt as much grief when he beheld the lord of sabaoth dishonoured as he would have done had he been himself the author of such shameful reproaches should christ reign in us as he ought to rule in his faithful subjects this same feeling will powerfully influence our minds and every dishonour done to god's glory will torment us as much as if our own bosoms were filled with such reproaches of the most high away with all those whose highest ambition is to obtain the greatest honours in the roman hierarchy which dishonours the name of god with every kind of reproaches tramples christ under its feet rails in reproachful language against the gospel itself and persecutes it with fire and sword it is indeed unsafe to receive such honours not from the despisers merely but the very reproaches of christ for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope now the god of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to christ jesus that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify god even the father of our lord jesus christ for whatsoever this is an application of the example adduced by the psalmist to prevent any of his readers from imagining that his exhorting us to imitate christ was too far-fetched the apostle indeed here confirms his wisdom in quoting david and adds that there is no part of the scriptures which may not contribute to our instruction and to the forming of our life and manners this beautiful passage shows us that the oracles of god contain nothing vain or unprofitable and the assiduous study and perusal of these records of unchanging wisdom contribute to advance our piety and holiness of life let us therefore labour most assiduously in learning the contents of the book of god and never forget it is the only writing in which the creator and preserver of heaven and earth condescends to converse with man it would be a reproach on the holy spirit of truth to imagine he had taught us anything whose knowledge might not be of use to us and let us ever remember that his instructions tend invariably to the advancement of our piety notwithstanding paul is here speaking of the old testament yet the same opinion must be entertained of the writings of the apostles for if the spirit of christ always resembles itself we can entertain no doubt of his adapting his doctrine to the instruction of his people now by the apostles as he formerly did by the prophets this passage affords a complete refutation of those fanatical spirits who boast of the abolishing of the old testament as if it had no relation and was of no use to christians what shameless impudence is it to endeavour to turn aside the attention of christians from these holy books which according to paul's testimony are designed by god himself to promote their salvation the additional part of the verse that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope does not include all the parts of that usefulness which is to be derived from the word of god but gives only a brief statement of its chief end and design for the scriptures are chiefly devoted to the object of forming our minds to patience of strengthening and confirming our comfort of raising us to the hope of a better even an eternal life and of keeping our meditation and contemplation fixed on that glorious kingdom i have no objections against translating comfort by exhortation but the former agrees better with the nature and character of patience because the latter springs and emanates from the former for we are then at last prepared to endure the billows of adversity when god smooths them by his own comfort for the patience of believers is not that unfeeling apathy commanded by the stoics and philosophers in the heathen world but that meekness and quietness of spirit by which we willingly and cheerfully submit ourselves to god while all things are rendered sweet and pleasant to us by the taste and sense of his fatherly goodness kindness condescension and love this patience so cherishes and sustains peace in our hearts as to prevent us from fainting now the god of patience god is thus denominated from the effects produced by him and which were on a former occasion attributed to the scripture from a very excellent but different reason god is indeed the alone author of patience and comfort because he inspires both these graces into our hearts by his spirit yet he uses his word as the instrument for accomplishing this object for god first teaches us by his word what true consolation and patience are and he afterwards inspires and engrafts the doctrine thus taught in our hearts minds affections and wills paul now turns from admonishing and exhorting the romans to the performance of their duty and has recourse to prayer for he was well assured that no dissertation of his own concerning duty could accomplish anything 
unless God, by the internal operation of his spirit, should perform what he had spoken by the mouth of man. The whole object of the Apostle's prayer is to bring the minds of the Romans to true union of spirit, and to make them harmonize with each other. He shows at the same time this bond of unity to consist in their being of the same mind according to the will of Christ. Every conspiracy, combination, and union out of God is misery, and whatever alienates our affections from the truth is out of God and to make our union in christ still more desirable paul points out its great necessity since we cannot glorify god truly unless the hearts of all believers unite to celebrate his praise and their tongues also sing one joyful hallelujah to his glory let none dare to boast that he will glorify god in his own way for the fountain of love sets so high a value upon the unity of his servants that he will not suffer his glory to be sounded in the midst of the din of discord and contention this one thought our harmony in praising god ought to silence forever the madness and wantonness with which dispute and controversy are carried on by too many at the present period wherefore receive ye one another as christ also received us to the glory of god now i say that jesus christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of god to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the gentiles might glorify god for his mercy as it is written for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Wherefore receive ye one another. In strengthening his exhortation, Paul clings to the example of Christ, for the messiah embraced not one or two of the brethren but all at the same time in such a manner as to show we ought to cherish each other if we are desirous to remain in his bosom of infinite love we shall finally in this manner confirm our calling if we do not separate ourselves from those with whom we are united by the lord the sentence to the glory of god may relate either to us only or to christ or to both conjointly i take it in the last mentioned sense as Christ has illustrated the glory of the Father by receiving us all to his grace when we stood in need of mercy, so we ought to establish and ratify the union and harmony which we have with Christ for the purpose of magnifying the glory of the same God. Now I say that Jesus Christ. Paul now shows in what way Christ embraced us all, where he leaves no difference between the Jews and Gentiles, except his having first been promised, and in some measure peculiarly destined to the Jewish nation, before he was manifested to the Gentiles. But he shows there was no difference between Jews and Gentiles in what was the source of all their disputes, for Christ had collected both of them from their miserable scattered state, brought them, when thus assembled together into the kingdom of his Father, to form one flock, one sheepfold, one shepherd paul hence infers that it is proper for them to continue united and not to despise each other since neither of them was contemned or neglected by christ he therefore first speaks of the jews and states that jesus was sent to them for the purpose of fulfilling the truth of god by performing the promises given to the fathers and it is no mean or trifling honour that christ the lord of heaven and earth was clothed with flesh for the purpose of becoming a servant to procure their salvation for he has conferred upon them a great honour in proportion to the low state of humiliation in which he was placed on their account paul assumes this as an acknowledged and undoubted principle so that we have greater cause to feel surprised at the impudence of certain fanatics who do not hesitate to confine all the promises of the old testament to the body to time and the present world paul to prevent the gentiles from claiming any excellence to themselves greater than that of the jews expressly declares the salvation procured by christ to have been the peculiar privilege of the jews according to covenant because by his coming into the world he had fulfilled the promise formerly made by god the father to abraham and had thus become the servant of the jewish people the consequence follows that the ancient covenant was really and in truth spiritual although annexed to earthly types and figures for the fulfilment of the promises concerning which paul is here writing must necessarily be referred to everlasting salvation to prevent the cavil that since the covenant itself was given to abraham salvation has only been promised to his grandchildren and posterity the apostle expressly confines the promises themselves to the fathers the power therefore and virtue of christ himself must either be confined to earthly and bodily blessings or the covenant made with abraham extended farther than merely fleshly enjoyments and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. 
Paul dwells a little longer in proving the mercy shown to the Gentiles. The first quotation cited by Paul is certainly taken from Psalm 18.50 to Samuel 22.50, where it is an undoubted prophecy concerning the kingdom of Christ. Paul also proves the calling of the Gentiles from this circumstance, that the confession of God's glory among the Gentiles is there promised. For we cannot truly preach God except among those who hear his praises while they are sung in the congregation of the righteous. God's name, therefore, cannot be celebrated among the heathen without enduing them with the knowledge and conferring upon them the communion of the people of the Lord. For the praises of God cannot be proclaimed except in the assembly of the faithful, whose ears are capable of hearing the joyful sound of the gospel. Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. I do not agree with those who consider this quotation to be taken from the Song of Moses, for the Jewish lawgiver intends, in that part of his writings, rather to strike terror in the adversaries of Israel than to invite them to the participation of one common joy. I take it, therefore, from Psalm 67, verses 3 and 4, where the psalmist says, Let the people praise thee, O God, let all the people praise thee, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Paul added, With the people of God, for the sake of explanation. For the psalmist indeed unites in that passage, the heathens with Israel and invites both equally to join in rejoicing, which can only take place where God is known. Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles. This is a very appropriate quotation, for how could a people wholly ignorant of the greatness of God offer praises to his name? They could no more do this than call upon his name, with which they were altogether and entirely unacquainted. It proves, therefore, in a conclusive manner, the calling of the Gentiles. The reason assigned by the psalmist that we should thank the Lord for his mercy and truth gives additional force to Paul's reasoning. Psalm 117, verses 1 and 2. Again, Isaiah. This prophecy, Isaiah 11.10, is the most distinguished of all yet adduced, for the prophet in that passage comforts the small remains of the faithful when their affairs were in the most deplorable and almost desperate situation, by stating that a branch should come out of the dry and dead trunk of the family of David, and a bough, which would restore the people of God to their former glory, should flourish from a despised root. The description of the prophet manifestly shows Christ, the Redeemer of the world, to be the branch, which will be lifted up as an ensign to which the Gentiles will seek for salvation. Paul translates the expressions of the prophet, stand for an ensign of the people, by the word rise, which implies the same sense and points to the distinguished eminence and conspicuous appearance of the Lord Jesus. Paul translates seek by trust, since in the usual language of Scripture, to seek God is to trust in Him. The calling of the Gentiles is confirmed in this prophecy, since Christ is said to be raised up to them as a sign who reigns in the midst of believers alone, and this cannot take place without the preaching of the Word and the illumination of the Spirit. The Song of Simeon corresponds with this passage from Isaiah, Hope in Christ is a testimony of his divinity. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Now the God of hope. Paul concludes his remarks with prayer, requesting the giver of all good to grant the Romans obedience to all his commands. This clearly shows that the source of all excellence never thinks of regulating, measuring, and determining his commands according to the extent of the powers or of the free will of mankind. His orders with respect to our duties are given in such a manner that we never once think of preparing to obey them by any reliance upon our own powers. The commands of the Lord of glory can only be performed by a steady reliance upon the assistance of His grace, and we are thus continually excited to feel a zeal and an ardour in our supplications to the throne of mercy. The sense of this passage is the following. May God, in whom all our hope is placed, fill you with a lively joy in your conscience, with unity and harmony in your faith, because your peace with God can never receive his approbation until you are united in the bonds of a pure, unadulterated faith. 
some understand the passage to mean that peace contributes to belief for we are then properly and justly prepared to place all our faith in god and his word when with calmness tranquillity unanimity and harmony we embrace the doctrine of the word of truth faith however is more properly combined with peace and joy since it is the bond of a holy and legitimate concord and union and the support and foundation of a pious joy although peace may mean the internal rest and tranquillity which we enjoy in god yet the context leads us to the explanation already given the apostle adds that ye may abound in hope because this grace is thus confirmed and increased in believers the power of the holy ghost means that all our blessings are the gifts of the divine goodness power implies and commends the wonderful and astonishing virtue by which the spirit of holiness love and consolation works and produces in us believers faith hope joy and peace and i myself also am persuaded paul by this concession is desirous to conciliate the believers in rome who might consider themselves attacked and aggrieved by so many and such anxious instructions and admonitions he excuses his boldness therefore in assuming the character of a teacher and exhorter among the romans he assures them that his conduct in this instance arose from a sense of duty and not from any doubt of their prudence goodness perseverance or constancy by this conduct paul removes all the invidious feeling of rashness which might have been brought against him for intruding into an office which peculiarly belonged to another or for treating on subjects which did not pertain to his province paul manifests the singular modesty and holiness of his heart and feelings who was content and delighted to be regarded and esteemed as nothing provided the doctrine he preached acquired by such conduct increased authority the romans were distinguished for pride and arrogance even the very meanest and lowest of the people were puffed up by the very name of the imperial city hence they were dissatisfied with the instructions of a foreigner a barbarian and a jew paul had no wish to contend with this pride and conceit in his own private name and power he is desirous to soothe and subdue it in his character and office as an apostle of the meek and lowly jesus full of goodness filled with all knowledge kindness prudence or skill in giving advice are the chief characters of a wise and good teacher and instructor kindness inclines to assist the brethren by its counsels by gentleness and courtesy of language and demeanour prudence or skill in giving advice secures authority and the means of affording valuable and useful information to all who are prepared to listen to its instruction malignity and arrogance are so entirely and completely opposed to brotherly kindness and instruction that wanderers from the path of rectitude treat advice when given in such a manner with pride and contempt and are prepared rather to manifest the pride haughtiness and ridicule of contempt than to submit to correction from such a quarter harshness whether in language or the appearance of the countenance deprives instruction of its use and value a combination of kindness courteousness prudence and skill in business is highly necessary in giving advice the romans who were abundantly endowed with kindness and skill in giving advice were fully enabled according to paul to exhort and encourage each other without receiving assistance from any other quarter nevertheless brethren i have written the more boldly unto you paul that he may show the greatness of his modesty in the excuse which he offers for having given the romans advice says by way of concession that he had as an apostle confidently interposed in performing for them in this case a duty which they were able to do by their own skill and powers he adds that the boldness which he manifested on this occasion arose from the necessity imposed upon him by his office as a minister of the gospel to the gentiles and he could not therefore pass by those who belonged to the heathens paul exalts by humbling himself the excellence of his office he does not suffer his apostolic office to be despised but confirms the honour thus conferred upon him by ascribing it to the grace of god paul asserts that he had not assumed the office of a teacher but an admonisher whose duty consists in recalling to mind truths which were already known i prefer the translation consecrating the gospel to the version adopted at first by erasmus ministering the gospel paul undoubtedly alludes here to the sacred mysteries performed by the priest he makes himself a priest in the office of the gospel by offering those believers whom he secures to become servants of the most high as a sacrifice to the lord of glory in this way he is employed in performing the sacred mysteries of the gospel the priesthood of a true christian pastor consists in offering men whom they have brought to yield obedience to the gospel as sacrifices to the lord of hosts 
how different the conduct of the roman catholics who boast with great pride in their reconciling men to god by the offering of christ paul does not denominate the pastors of the church of christ simply priests by a perpetual title but he uses the metaphor on this occasion because he is desirous to commend the dignity and efficacy of his ministry every preacher of the gospel in the performance of his functions as an ambassador of christ ought always to keep in mind the end and design of his office namely the offering to god of souls which have been purified by faith erasmus afterwards corrected his first translation ministering the gospel and adopted in an improper and obscure sense the version sacrificing the gospel the gospel must be viewed as the sword with which the minister of the word of god offers men as victims and sacrifices to the king of glory he adds that such victims are acceptable to god and thus not only commends his ministry but affords great and distinguished comfort and consolation to believers who deliver themselves up to be consecrated as ancient sacrifices were dedicated to god by certain sanctifications purifications and washings so believers in christ are consecrated as victims to the lord by the spirit of consolation truth and peace and are separated from the world lying in the wicked one by the inward operations and power of the holy ghost for although purity of mind arises from faith in god's word yet because the voice of man can of itself accomplish nothing and is dead the office of purifying the believer belongs truly really and properly to the spirit of grace and love i have therefore whereof i may glory through jesus christ in those things which pertain to god for i will not dare to speak of any of those things which christ hath not wrought by me to make the gentiles obedient by word and deed through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the spirit of god so that from jerusalem and round about unto illyricum i have fully preached the gospel of christ yea so have i strived to preach the gospel not where christ was named lest i should build upon another man's foundation but as it is written to whom he was not spoken of they shall see and they that have not heard shall understand i have therefore paul after commending in general his calling with a view to inform the romans of his being a true and an undoubted apostle of christ breaks forth into the language of praise and shows he had not only undertaken but adorned in a very distinguished manner the apostolic office which had been enjoined him by the appointment of god he mentions his own fidelity to which he has steadily adhered in the execution of his office our appointment to an office is of little moment if we do not answer to our calling and give satisfaction in performing our duties the apostle does not commend himself from an ardent desire for securing glory and honour but that he might leave no means untried by which he might secure among the people at rome favour and authority to the doctrine which he taught he glories therefore in god and not himself and the design and tendency of the whole passage is to return lasting and solid praise to the lord of hosts his speaking negatively is a sign of modesty while it confirms the truth of his assertions the following is the sense of the passage truth itself affords me so copious a subject for glorying that satisfied with what is true i have no occasion to have recourse to false praise which others have a right to claim as their own perhaps too he wished to anticipate evil reports which he knew the malevolent were ready to rumour on all occasions and in all places and he therefore ushers in his remarks by observing that he intended to speak on subjects which were well known and fully ascertained to be true to make the gentiles obedient this sentence shows that paul intended to add weight to his ministry among the romans by pointing out the power and success of his doctrine signs prove that god by the presence of his own power had so afforded a witness to the preaching of paul and set a seal to his apostleship that none had a right to doubt his mission and appointment to be from the lord of the harvest word work and miracles are intended by signs and it hence appears that the meaning of the word deed is more extensive than miracles the concluding sentence by the power of the spirit means that the holy ghost alone could be the author of those signs and wonders and word and work in fine paul asserts that both by teaching and acting he had possessed great power and energy in preaching christ by which the wonderful efficacy of the almighty was made to appear miracles were also superadded and as seals certified and declared more fully that the hand of the lord was with our apostle by the nature extent and magnitude of the works which he performed after first stating word and deed he particularly specifies the power of working miracles thus luke twenty four nineteen christ is said to have been powerful in word and work in john five thirty six christ himself sends the jews to his own works as affording a testimony of his divinity 
Paul does not simply mention miracles, but distinguishes them by two different titles. Peter, Acts 2.22, calls what are here termed mighty signs and wonders, miracles and wonders and signs. These are indeed proofs and testimonies of the divine energy for the purpose of exciting and awakening the attention of mankind, that, being struck and deeply impressed by the amazing power of the Lord, they may at the same time wonder, admire, and adore the works of his hands. They convey to us an important meaning, and these signs rouse us to have a more full and extensive acquaintance with God, the Creator and Redeemer of mankind. This is a striking passage concerning the use of miracles which are calculated to excite in man a reverence and obedience to God. Thus, Mark 16.20, the Lord confirmed the word with signs following, and Luke, Acts 14.3, says, The Lord gave testimony unto the word of his grace by wonders. Every power and every means, therefore, by which glory is sought for the creature and not for God the Creator, by which belief is secured for lies and lying vanities and not for the word of infinite truth, evidently spring from the devil. I refer the power of the Spirit of God, which is last mentioned by Paul, to the word, to works and to miracles, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, Paul adds as a testimony to the success of his ministry the effects which it had produced, for the results of his preaching surpassed all human powers. For what preacher, unassisted by the power of God, could have collected so many churches to Christ? Paul says, I have propagated the gospel from Jerusalem to Illyricum, not proceeding in a straightforward course, but visiting, by a circuitous route, all the intermediate parts of the country. The Greek verb, translated fully preached, means to perfect as well as to supply what is wanting, and the verbal noun derived from it implies both perfection and supplement. I therefore readily adopt the following exposition of the passage. That Paul diffused the preaching of the gospel by supplying the lack of others, for he had disseminated the divine truth much more extensively than any of the other apostles or preachers of the gospel by whom he had been preceded. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel." because it was necessary for Paul not only to prove himself a servant of Christ and pastor of the Christian church, but to claim the character and office of an apostle with a view to secure the attentive audience of the Romans, he here lays down the proper and peculiar mark and distinctive character of apostleship. The duty indeed of an apostle is to disseminate the gospel where it has not yet been preached, according to the command of Christ, go and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16.15. We must be careful in making this observation, lest we adduce it as an universal example which ought to be peculiarly limited and confined to the order of apostles. The substituting of successes to the first builders of the Church of Christ can be blamed by none, for while the apostles must be considered the founders of the Church, the pastor who succeeded them ought to defend, and also to enlarge and increase the building which these favoured servants of God have erected. Paul calls that another man's foundation, which has been laid by some other apostle, for Christ, properly speaking, is the only stone on which the church is built. 1 Corinthians 3.11, Ephesians 2.20. But, as it is written, Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 52, verse 15, confirms what Paul had said concerning the sign of his apostleship. For, in Isaiah 52.10, the prophet, when speaking of the kingdom of the Messiah, predicts that the Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. It was necessary for the fulfillment of this prophecy that the knowledge of Christ should be carried to the heathen who had never yet heard of his name. A special command was given to the apostles for the performance of this great work, and the apostleship of Paul is manifestly established because in him this prophecy is fulfilled. There is no foundation for perverting this passage by applying it to the pastoral office, for we know that the name of Christ must always continue to be preached in well-regulated and properly constituted churches, where the truth of the gospel has been for a long period felt and acknowledged. Paul, therefore, preached Christ to foreign nations, which were wholly unacquainted with the principles of the gospel, that the pastors of the church might daily and constantly proclaim with their lips the same doctrine after his departure, in every place where he had sown the seeds of divine righteousness and truth. The justice of this observation is clearly established, since the predictions of the prophet Isaiah in the passage here quoted by Paul evidently relate to the commencement of the kingdom of Christ. For which cause, also, I have been much hindered from coming to you, but now, having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, 
whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. For which cause also? Paul excuses his conduct for not having visited the Romans sooner, since he had been appointed for them as well as the rest of the heathens. Paul therefore embraces this opportunity for making his apology to the Romans, and shows that in disseminating the gospel from Judea to Illyricum he had completed a certain course which was assigned him by the Lord, and had resolved, on accomplishing this part of his apostolic labours, not to neglect the Romans. He removes all suspicion which they might feel of want of due attention on his part to their spiritual interests and welfare, by declaring and testifying his long-continued desire to accomplish this object. A just impediment had prevented him from accomplishing his intended journey to Rome at an earlier period, but he now gives them hopes of a visit as soon as his calling will allow. The argument taken from this passage to prove that Paul went to Spain is weak and inconclusive, for it by no means immediately follows that our apostle went to that country because it was his intention to carry the gospel thither for paul only speaks of the hope which he entertained of accomplishing a visit to the spaniards but he might as other believers have done sometimes experience the disappointment of his expectations for i trust to see you paul touches upon the cause of his long-continued wish and present determination to come to the romans that he might see them and enjoy a personal interview and social conversation with the disciples of christ in rome and appear before them in his apostolic character and office for an increase of the gospel is comprehended under the arrival and visit of an apostle. When Paul says, I shall be brought on my way thitherward by you, he intimates how much pleasure he promised himself from their kindness and benevolence, and this, as we have already stated, was the best and surest plan for securing their favour and esteem. For every person considers his obligation to another increased in proportion to the extent of the confidence with which he knows that a reliance is placed upon his assistance, for we regard it as a disgrace and inconsistent with all the feelings of humanity to deceive any one in the opinion which they have formed of our aid and kindness. The subjoined sentence, If first I be somewhat filled with your company, proves the reciprocal kindness which the Apostle was desirous to cultivate, and it was of very great importance for the interest of the Gospel that the Romans should be convinced of his entertaining this feeling. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Archaea to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this, and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain, and I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ." But now, to prevent the Romans from soon expecting his arrival and considering themselves to be deceived, should he be detained longer than they imagined, Paul acquaints them with his present journey to Jerusalem for the purpose of carrying the alms which had been collected for the poor in that city from Archaea and Macedonia. This duty, he observes, would hinder his immediate journey to Rome. He seizes this opportunity and gradually proceeds to recommend this contribution that he might excite the Romans by hints to imitate the conduct of their Archaean and Macedonian brethren. For, although he does not openly request the Romans to make a collection, yet by stating that it was the bounden duty of Macedonia and Archaea to adopt the course which on this occasion they had observed, he gently intimates the same duty to be required of the Romans, since they were in circumstances precisely similar. His open confession to the Corinthians proves this to have been his object, where, 2 Corinthians 9.2, he states, I boast of you to them of Macedonia, and Archaea was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. It was indeed an instance of rare piety that the Greeks, on hearing of the poverty of their Christian brethren at Jerusalem, did not consider the great distance by which they were separated from them, but in consequence of their union by the bond of faith, they regarded Zion as not too far removed from Corinth, and relieved the indigence of the believers in that city out of their own abundance." The word contribution or communication is very properly used, for it very well expresses the affection and feeling with which we ought to assist the poverty of our brethren on account of the common mutual and reciprocal relation arising from the unity which exists among the members of the body of the church. 
because the greek pronoun which means a certain contribution is often redundant and does not add to the emphasis of the passage i have entirely omitted it in my version i have translated the greek participle which signifies ministering by the verb to minister since it seems to express more properly the meaning of paul for he assigns as an excuse for not hastening immediately his journey to rome the just and useful business of supplying the wants of the saints in which he was then engaged and their debtors they are every reader must feel convinced that the obligation here mentioned applies as strongly to the romans as the corinthians for the former people were as deeply indebted to the jews as the macedonians or inhabitants of corinth paul assigns also the cause of the obligation which was the receiving of the gospel from the jews and derives his argument from the less to the greater he uses this reasoning one corinthians nine eleven if we have sown unto you spiritual things is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things which are immensely much more vile and contemptible than the blessings of the gospel paul shows the value of the kingdom of heaven by declaring the heathens to be debtors not only to the ministers and servants of divine truth but to the whole jewish nation from whom these ministers had been descended the greek word here translated minister signifies to perform the duty assigned by the state and to undergo the burdens of the calling determined by providence on some occasions also it is referred to the performance of sacred duties paul i have no doubt meant by this term a kind of sacrifice to be offered by believers when they supplied the necessities and poverty of their indigent brethren out of their own substance for the duty of love which they owe is paid in such a manner as to be offered at the same time as a sacrifice of sweet-smelling savour to jehovah the king of glory paul however had a peculiar regard in this passage to the mutual satisfaction and recompense which could be claimed as a just debt by the jews from the heathens on account of these spiritual blessings flowing to the latter from the former who ought to repay them by temporal comforts when i have sealed to them this fruit i think paul here made an allusion to the custom of the ancients who secured and shut up by the seal of a signet their valuable treasures paul thus commends his fidelity and integrity and declares he will be as faithful a keeper of the money entrusted to his hands as if he carried it under a seal fruit indicates the yearly profit and revenue accruing to the jews as paul had just mentioned from the sowing of the gospel just as the field properly cultivated supports the husbandman by the fruit which it yields and i am sure that when i come unto you i shall come in the fullness these expressions admit of two explanations the first sense is that he would find an abundant fruit of the gospel at rome for good works the fruit of faith form the great blessing of the gospel since i am by no means satisfied with the interpretation which limits the meaning of this expression to almsgiving the second explanation follows paul for the purpose of making the romans more earnest in wishing for his arrival expresses a hope that he would not be unfruitful since a great increase of the gospel here called the fullness of the blessing or by a hebraism full blessing and which means the prosperous success and enlargement of the divine kingdom would be the consequence of his exertions this blessing depended partly upon paul's ministry and partly upon the faith of the romans he promises therefore that he would not visit them in vain since he would not uselessly throw away among them the grace which he had received but lay it out to a good purpose on account of the alacrity with which they were prepared to receive the gospel the former interpretation is more commonly received and more completely meets my approbation that paul on his account expected he would have his most earnest desires gratified by finding the gospel flourishing and prospering among them with distinguished success by the great holiness of their lives and their excellence in every kind of virtue he assigns as a cause of his desire the uncommon joy which he expected to derive from an interview with believers whom he would behold abounding in all the spiritual riches of the everlasting gospel now i beseech you brethren for the lord jesus christ's sake and for the love of the spirit that ye strive together with me in your prayers to god for me that i may be delivered from them that do not believe in judea and that my service which i have for jerusalem may be accepted of the saints that i may come unto you with joy by the will of god and may with you be refreshed now the god of peace be with you all amen now i beseech you very many passages prove the malignant and spiteful grudge entertained against paul by his own nation on account of the false complaints and calumnies raised to ruin his character as if he taught the forsaking of moses and of the law 
Paul knew how easily the greatest innocence may be oppressed by unfounded accusations, particularly among those who are hurried off by inconsiderate and blind zeal. The witnessing of the Spirit, mentioned Acts 20.23, occasionally forewarned him that bonds and afflictions abode him at jerusalem his trouble increased therefore with the extent of the danger to which he saw he was exposed hence proceeded his very great anxiety in commending his own safety to the various churches nor need we be surprised at his solicitude on account of his own life since he knew its loss would be accompanied with so great a danger to the church paul testifies what trouble and care distressed his pious breast what vehemence also appears in his calling god to witness while to the name of the lord he adds the love of the spirit by which the saints ought mutually to embrace each other he ceases not however in the midst of so much fear and trembling to pursue an onward course nor is he so afraid of danger as not to be willingly prepared to undergo it but he furnishes himself with divine remedies he summons to his assistance the aid of the church that by their prayers he may receive comfort according to the lord's promise where two or three are gathered together in my name there am i in the midst of them matthew eighteen twenty and again i say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask it shall be done for them of my father which is in heaven matthew eighteen nineteen and he beseeches them by christ and the love of the spirit that none might imagine what he commended them to do was slight or trifling that is called the love of the spirit in which we are united by christ because it is not of the flesh nor of the world but proceeds from his spirit which is the bond of our unity since therefore to be assisted by the prayers of the faithful is so great a divine blessing that even paul himself that most chosen instrument of god did not think of neglecting it what sloth and indolence is it on our part who are misery vileness and nothingness itself to despise this powerful means of obtaining the smiles of omnipotence it is the height of impudence to take this passage as an occasion and handle for supporting the doctrine of the intercession of dead saints that ye strive together with me the version by erasmus to assist me in my labours is not a bad one but i prefer a literal translation because it is more emphatic for the word strive shows the straits in which he was placed and when he orders his brethren to assist him in this pressing difficulty we see a proof of the affection which believers ought to feel for each other in their intercessory prayers they should actually take upon themselves the person and character of their afflicted brethren as if they were placed in the same difficulty and necessity he points also to the effect which these intercessors are capable of producing for by commending a brother to the lord he takes a part of the burden upon himself and affords him so much assistance and relief and if our strength is placed in calling on the name of god we cannot bestow greater strength upon our brethren than by invoking for their assistance the name of jehovah that my service which i have for jerusalem paul's calumniators had been so successful in their false charges against him as to excite in his breast a feeling of solicitude lest the present which he was carrying might not be very welcome from his hands although it would be offered in the midst of such pressing want and necessity at a very convenient season our apostle's astonishing meekness appears from his not ceasing to labour for the temporal wants of the jews even while he entertained a doubt of his exertions being regarded with pleasure by those very persons whose wants he was endeavouring to supply we ought to imitate his disposition of mind manifested on this occasion and never cease performing acts of kindness to those from whom we have no certain and well-founded cause to expect the least gratitude paul knew that saints also on some occasions might be hurried off by false accusations and induced to entertain an evil and harsh opinion of the conduct of some of their brethren our apostle persists in making honourable mention of those very believers even when he certainly knew his character to be injured by their representations the additional sentence that i may come unto you implies that this prayer would also prove highly useful to the romans since his being killed in judea would prevent his exertions for their advantage and instruction it was of importance also that he should come with joy since should he arrive among them in all the liveliness of hilarity and without one gloom of grief and sorrow he would be enabled to devote all his time all his attention and all his pains and study with more animation and more activity to the promoting of their spiritual improvement the expression refreshed or delighted shows how fully convinced he was of their fraternal attachment the sentence by the will of god instructs us in the necessity of devoting ourselves to prayer since god alone directs all our paths and all our steps by his gracious and unerring providence now the god of peace 
the universal expression with you all shows that paul did not pray to god for his presence and favour merely with the romans in general but for his guidance and direction of every individual believer in that city the epithet peaceful must be referred to the circumstance of the passage and means may god the author of peace extend his preserving care to every saint in rome end of section twenty one section twenty two of a commentary on the epistle to the romans by john calvin translated by francis sibson this librivox recording is in the public domain romans sixteen verses one to twenty seven i commend unto you phoebe our sister which is a servant of the church which is at cancria that ye may receive her in the lord as becometh saints and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of for she hath been a succourer of many and of myself also greet priscilla and aquila my helpers in christ jesus who have for my life laid down their own necks unto whom not only i give thanks but also all the churches of the gentiles likewise greet the church that is in their house salute my well-beloved epinetus who is of the first fruits of archaea unto christ greet mary who bestowed much labour on us salute andronicus and junia my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in christ before me greet amplius my beloved in the lord salute urban our helper in christ and stachus my beloved salute apelles approved in christ salute them which are of aristobulus's household salute herodian my kinsmen greet them that be of the household of narcissus which are in the lord salute tryphena and tryphosa who labour in the lord salute the beloved persis which laboured much in the lord salute rufus chosen in the lord and his mother and mine salute asyncritus phlegon hermus patrobus hermes and the brethren which are with them salute philologus and julia nereus and his sister and olympus and all the saints which are with them salute one another with an holy kiss the churches of christ salute you i commend unto you a considerable part of this chapter is devoted to salutations and as they are attended with no difficulty it would be a loss of time to dwell at any length upon so plain a subject i will touch only on those points which require some elucidation he commends phoebe the bearer of the epistle first from her office as having been a very honest and holy servant of the church and secondly for having always devoted her time and labour to the supplying of the wants of all the believers on which account it was their bounden duty to pay her every attention paul orders her to be received in the church because she was a servant of the church at cancria his additional sentence as becometh saints intimates that it would be altogether unworthy and unbecoming the servants of christ to show her no honour and distinguish her by no kindness and indeed it is highly becoming to embrace with affection to manifest esteem peculiar love and honour to all the members of christ but especially to such as are employed in any public function and office paul orders them to show her in return aid and assistance as she had been invariably kind in attending to the wants and demands of all the brethren it is merely obeying the voice of humanity not to forsake a character whose disposition is naturally benevolent when he stands in need of the assistance of others paul with a view of increasing their kindness to her includes himself among those who had received personal assistance at her hands our apostle one timothy five nine and ten acquaints us with the ministry to which he here alludes public officers were appointed by the church for attending to the maintenance and support of the poor and widows who were released from domestic cares and labours encumbered with no children and were constantly desirous to devote themselves to the duties of religion and obedience to the lord were appointed to this office and bound by strict obligation to its fulfilment they were not at liberty to consider themselves to be their own mistresses since all their time and attention were required to take care of others the apostle accuses them of want of faithfulness and of adherence to their engagements if they resigned the office to which they were appointed paul forbids therefore the choosing of widows under threescore years old one timothy five eleven since he clearly foresaw that a vow of perpetual celibacy which it was necessary for them to observe was dangerous nay ruinous before that age this very holy office which was extremely useful to the church degenerated during the more corrupt periods of christianity into the idle and lazy order of nuns 
Although this order from its very first origin was bad and contrary to the word of God, yet it has now so far degenerated from its original object that it is as dangerous as a brothel would be if situated within a chapel set apart to chastity. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. These testimonies are given to the characters of certain members by the church with a view to confer honour on probity by the esteem which is shown the virtuous and worthy, and to increase the authority and power of such as have the inclination and the will to be useful to others. They are necessary also in exciting an ardour in the breasts of those who are commended to pursue with steady perseverance their former paths of virtue, and not to faint in their career of piety, nor to grow languid in their zeal. He confers distinguished honour on Aquila and Priscilla, who was the wife of the former, as stated by Luke, Acts 18.1. The peculiar modesty of our holy apostle appears in the praise he bestows on Priscilla, since he does not despise the assistance of a female in the work of the Lord, nor blushes to confess the advantage which he had experienced from such a coadjutor. Unto whom not only I give thanks. Paul here gives a testimony of his private gratitude to Priscilla and Aquila on account of the protection which they afforded his life by not sparing their own. He endeavours to excite feelings of kindness in the breasts of the Romans to these two saints by mentioning the thankfulness of all the churches of Christ. Paul was deservedly esteemed and loved by all the heathens since he was an incomparable treasure, and we need not be surprised to find all the Gentile churches impressed with a deep sense of their obligation to the preservers of so valuable a life. It is worthy of observation that Paul could not confer a more distinguished honour and ornament on this family than by making mention of the church in their house. I am not satisfied with Erasmus's translation, Congregation, for Paul undoubtedly made an honourable mention of the church in this passage. Who is the first fruits of Archaea unto Christ? This alludes to legal ceremonies, for since those are sanctified to God by faith who have the first place in being offered to the Lord of hosts, they are properly denominated firstfruits. Besides, the prerogative of honour is bestowed by Paul according to the priority of time, when faith took place. This, however, is only the case when they persevere in the faith steadfast unto the end. Certainly no small honour is bestowed on such as are chosen to be the firstfruits unto God. A greater and nobler proof of faith is exhibited by the length of its continuance when those who have commenced do not weary in their Christian course. He affords another proof of his gratitude by mentioning the labours and attention which Mary had bestowed. We cannot doubt his design in these honourable testimonies was to commend those whom he praised more strongly to the Romans. Salute Andronicus. Although Paul is not accustomed to affix any high value on family or other carnal privileges, yet because his relationship to Junia and Andronicus might contribute to make the Romans take more notice of them, he does not omit in the first place even this ground of praise. The second kind of praise which he bestows upon them, that of their being fellow prisoners, is of greater importance, because bonds are considered to be not the least honourable ornaments in the Christian warfare. Thirdly, Paul does not use the word apostles in its peculiar and usual sense, but in a more extended signification, and applies it to all those who do not establish merely some one church, but spend their time and labour in promulgating the gospel everywhere. In this passage, therefore, Paul generally calls those apostles who were employed in the preaching of the doctrine of salvation in various parts for the purpose of planting churches. He restricts the meaning of this word in other passages to the twelve disciples who were first chosen by Christ, and it would be absurd to ascribe this great excellence in the proper sense of the term to these two believers. He does not hesitate to prefer Andronicus and Junia to himself, because they had been the first to embrace the gospel of Christ. Greet them that are of the household of Narcissus. It would be too great a slight on Peter to have omitted mentioning him in so large a catalogue, had he, according to the opinion of Roman Catholics, been then at Rome. If, therefore, in doubtful questions we are compelled to have recourse to probable conjecture, no judicious person will be induced to believe the truth of their statement, since Paul never would have omitted the enumerating of so distinguished an apostle. It is also worthy of observation that none of those splendid and magnificent names are here mentioned, which might lead us to conclude that the Christians were persons of high rank, for such as are stated by Paul were of obscure and ignoble families. As I consider Narcissus, who is here mentioned to have been Claudius's freeman, 
infamous by the number of his crimes and the extent of his profligacy so the goodness of god which penetrated into this impure family burning with every kind of wickedness has a greater claim on our admiration i do not by any means consider narcissus himself to have been converted to christianity but it is very striking to find the grace of god visiting a house which resembled even hell itself since however those who constantly resided under the roof of a filthy pandra a most greedy robber and a thoroughly depraved character worshipped christ with purity slaves need not wait for the conversion of their masters but each may follow christ for himself it appears from the exceptions mentioned that there were only few believers in the family salute you with a holy kiss a kiss as appears from various passages in scripture was the frequent and usual mark of kindness among the jews such a custom was perhaps less common among the romans but it was not unusual women however were only allowed to receive the salutations of their relations this however became a practice among the ancients so that the christians mutually saluted each other before receiving the lord's supper as a mark and testimony of their friendship after which they gave alms for the purpose of providing also in very deed and effect what they had represented by a kiss as appears from one of chrysostom's homilies hence originated the ceremony now used among the roman catholics of kissing the cup and offering the oblation the former of these is a mere superstitious practice without any advantage the latter contributes to no other purpose than that of satiating if it be possible the avarice of the priests paul does not indeed appear positively to require this ceremony but he only exhorts them to cherish brotherly love which is distinguished by him from the profane friendship of the world that is generally either counterfeited or disguised or consists of nothing but wickedness or is kept together by evil arts and is never directed to a proper object nor tends to a useful end on wishing health to the churches he is desirous to bind together by the mutual bond of love all the members of christ now i beseech you brethren mark them which cause divisions and offences contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them for they that are such serve not our lord jesus christ but their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple for your obedience is come abroad unto all men i am glad therefore on your behalf but yet i would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil and the god of peace shall bruise satan under your feet shortly the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you amen and i beseech he now gives an exhortation which is necessary for occasionally correcting all churches since the ministers of satan constantly watch every opportunity for disturbing the kingdom of christ two methods are adopted by them for the purpose of producing this disturbance either by sowing dissensions which distract and withdraw the mind from the unity of the truth or exciting offences calculated to alienate them from the love of the gospel the former is effected when the truth of god is destroyed by doctrines of human invention the latter when it is rendered odious or contemptible by the contrivance of various arts he orders therefore a strict watch to be placed on such as adopt either of these methods with a view to prevent them from deceiving or seizing unawares the faithful who are off their guard and he is also desirous that believers should avoid keeping any society with designing men because ruin and destruction result from their conduct nor does he here require this attention for the faithful without cause for corrupt and vile characters often do much injury to the church from our negligence before they are opposed and if not prevented by great care and prudence frequently creep in by their surprising craftiness for the purpose of doing mischief observe also the address is directed to those who are instructed in the pure doctrine of god for to separate such as agree in the truth of christ is an impious and sacrilegious divorce but to defend a conspiracy for promoting lies and impious doctrines under the pretext of peace and unity is a shameless calumny the papists have no foundation for exciting by artful guile an unfavourable impression and low opinion of us believers from this passage for we do not attack and confute the gospel of christ but the falsehoods of the devil by which it has hitherto been obscured nay paul clearly proves that he does not condemn every kind of variance disagreement and separation without exception but those which break in pieces the harmony of the orthodox faith for the force of the passage lies in the sentence which you have heard since it was a necessary duty for the romans to depart from the manner of their country and the institutions of their ancestors before they were properly instructed in the principles of the gospel for they that are such 
Paul adds that a constant mark and necessary distinction between false prophets and the servants of Christ may be found in the former not paying the least regard to the glory of Christ, but minding only their own bellies. Since, however, they creep into the church by craft and conceal their own wickedness under a false and assumed character, he points out at the same time their arts to prevent any one from being deluded by that smooth and flattering language which they use as a means for securing to themselves favour. The preachers of the gospel are also distinguished by their own peculiar affability and pleasantness of manners, but combined at the same time with a freedom which prevents them from wheedling men by vain praises or alluring them by the indulgence of their vices. But these impostors not only entice the affections of others by flattery, but spare and gratify their vices with a view to attach them more strongly to their own persons. He applies the term simple to them, who want sufficient circumspection to avoid the fraudulent arts practised by such deceivers. For your obedience is come abroad, in answer to an objection which might be adduced against the apostle, that he exhorted the believers at Rome because he entertained an unfavourable opinion of their character, he points out to them his desire to prevent their fall, which without great watchfulness might easily happen. Paul argues in the following manner, your conduct gives me cause for rejoicing over you, since your obedience is indeed so universally praised, because, however, persons often fall in your case from simplicity, I am desirous you should be inexperienced and simple in committing evil, but distinguished for the highest prudence in virtue, and the preserving of your integrity whenever it is required. We here see that the simplicity praised in Christians leaves no ground for the pretense of those who at the present period regard a stupid ignorance of God's word as the highest virtue. For although he approves of the obedient and courteous conduct of the Romans, yet he is desirous that they should adopt such prudence and discrimination as would prevent their credulity from being exposed to impostures of any description. He therefore so congratulates them upon their freedom from wickedness as to manifest his desire of their acting with prudence in avoiding evil. The following expression, God shall bruise Satan, is rather a promise for confirming them than a prayer he exhorts them therefore to fight undauntedly without fear against satan and promises their speedy victory our great adversary indeed notwithstanding christ has gained one complete victory over him is ever ready to renew the engagement on which account paul promises them ultimate success in his overthrow which never appears during the continuance of the dispute paul not only speaks of the last day when satan must without doubt be utterly trodden under our feet but as the accuser of the brethren would even then as it were unloose and break asunder his reins and throw everything into strange confusion with pride and arrogance the apostle promises his future subjugation after a short period by the lord when he would give him to be trampled upon by the feet of the pious the following prayer for the grace of christ to continue with them implies their enjoyment of all those blessings which have been purchased for us by christ timotheus my workfellow and lucius and jason and sosipater my kinsmen salute you i tertius who wrote this epistle salute you in the lord gaius mine host and of the whole church saluteth you erastus the chamberlain of the city saluteth you and quartus a brother the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you all amen now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of jesus christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but is now made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting god made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to god only wise be glory through jesus christ for ever amen timothy etc salute you the underwritten salutations are intended both to cherish mutual concord and agreement among those who are situated at a great distance from each other, and also to make the Romans acquainted with the subscription of their brethren in the epistle. Paul, indeed, had no occasion for the testimony of others, but he derived very considerable advantage from their agreement and harmony. We find the epistle concluding with praise and thanksgiving to God, for Paul declares the distinguished kindness of his heavenly Father in vouchsafing the Gentiles the light of the gospel and his immense goodness, surpassing all praise, was made manifest in this exhibition of his love. This praise is indeed calculated both to elevate and confirm the confidence of the pious, that their minds aspiring to God, they may with certainty expect all the blessings which are here committed to him, and confirm also their future hope by his former favours. Since, however, Paul, by collecting many subjects into one sentence, has formed a long period which is involved by transposing the grammatical order of the words, we will divide the whole into its separate parts. 
Paul, in the first place, attributes all glory to God alone. In the second, for the purpose of showing it to be his just due, he incidentally mentions some of his attributes, to make it evident that he alone is worthy to receive every kind of praise. Wisdom is attributed by Paul to God alone, and by ascribing this praise to him, all other creatures are deprived of this prerogative. Paul, indeed, after having mentioned the secret counsel of God, seems designedly to have added this praise for the purpose of hurrying off his reader, that he might excite in all a reverence and admiration of his divine wisdom. For we know, when men do not perceive design in the works of God, how ready they are loudly to display their disapprobation. He affords the Romans more certain information concerning the doctrine of final perseverance when he adds God's power for confirming their strength, and to make them acquiesce with greater certainty in his power he adds the evidence borne to it by the gospel where you see a promise is not only given us of present grace but we enjoy also a certainty of the perpetual continuance of this great blessing for god does not declare in his gospel that he is only our father for the present but will continue such to the very last nay his adoption is extended beyond death for he conducts us to an eternal inheritance the power and dignity of the gospel are commended by the remaining statements of the apostle he calls the gospel the preaching of jesus christ as its whole sum is certainly contained in the knowledge of our redeemer its doctrine is denominated a revelation of the mystery to which we ought not only to listen with more attention but to impress it on our minds with feelings of the highest veneration it does not indeed present the pride of wisdom which is desired by the children of this world who on this account despise it but explains the unspeakable treasures of heavenly wisdom which are more exalted than the powers of the highest genius and if angels themselves regard these glories with adoration wonder and astonishment they cannot certainly be held in sufficient admiration by the most exalted of human beings nor ought this wisdom to be less valued because it lies concealed under mean and homely simplicity of words since it has pleased God by such a method to subdue the pride and arrogance of the flesh. But since some doubt might arise how a mystery, suppressed for so many ages, could have appeared, and showed itself in such a sudden manner, the Apostle informs us neither the rashness of man, nor any fortuitous casualty, but God's eternal ordination produced it, where the door is also closed against those questions of mere curiosity, which the frowardness and pride of human genius are apt to propose, for these consider every event which takes place suddenly and unexpectedly to occur without design, and hence often rashly infer that the works of God are absurd, or perplex themselves at least with many intricate doubts. Paul therefore admonishes us that the gospel, which had now appeared, was decreed by God before the foundation of the world, and to prevent any one from entering into a controversy for the purpose of discrediting the gospel by its novelty, he quotes the writings of the prophets, whose predictions we find to be now fulfilled for all the prophets bore so clear a testimony to the gospel that it cannot receive a better confirmation from any other source and in this way god has so properly prepared the mind of his people as to prevent them from feeling astonishment in consequence of the novelty of an unexpected event if any reader objects that paul contradicts himself because he says the mystery to which god bear testimony by the prophets had been concealed in all ages peter gives an easy solution of this difficulty when he says the prophets in their careful inquiries concerning the salvation which was to be offered to us ministered the things unto us and not unto themselves one peter one twelve god therefore was silent in what he spoke at that time because the revelation of those things concerning which he wished his servants to prophesy was kept by him in a state of suspense in what sense paul calls the gospel a hidden mystery in this passage in Ephesians 3.9 and Colossians 1.26, is not fully determined even among the learned. The opinion of those who refer it to the calling in of the Gentiles is the most forcible to which Paul himself expressly alludes in his epistle to the Colossians, Colossians 1.27. I grant this to be one, but not the sole cause, for I think there is a greater probability in supposing Paul to have regarded other points of difference between the Old and New Testament for notwithstanding all those subjects had formerly been taught by the prophets which christ and his apostles explained yet they had taught them in such an obscure manner when compared with this shining splendour of the light of the gospel that we need not be surprised if such things as are now done openly are said to have been hidden and concealed nor does malachi chapter four verse two prophesy in vain that the son of righteousness would arise with healing under his wings nor had isaiah before failed in extolling with such magnificent and splendid praise the embassy of the messiah finally the gospel is not without reason called the kingdom of god 
but we may more properly conclude from the subject itself that the treasures of heavenly wisdom had been finally then opened when god appeared as it were face to face by means of his own only begotten son and dispelled the ancient shadows of the mosaic dispensation paul again states the end and design of preaching the gospel which was mentioned in the beginning of the first chapter that god may gather together all nations to the obedience of faith end of section twenty two end of a commentary on the epistle to the romans by john calvin translated by francis sibson